Um, first up, does anybody have any reports or correspondence that they'd like to share? Go ahead, Councilor Noonan. Hi, thank you. I just want to let you know I met with Jay Brandeis from the Cape Community Ice Rink Group over at Gullcrest. And um, I also spoke on the phone with resident uh, Elisa Tarlow about the town center project. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Boucher. I also spoke to um, resident Elisa Tarlow on the affordable housing project. Great. Any other reports? Go ahead, Valerie. I, I would just like to say congratulations to all of our Cape Elizabeth High School graduates. Congratulations to all of you, your families, your parents, um, and um, best wishes on your next big adventure. And speaking of adventures, I'd also like to congratulate our own Deborah Lane for 35 years this month. Congratulations, Deborah, and thanks for being on this adventure with us. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Devereaux. Um, anybody else with anything? Um, I'll mention, uh, like uh, Councilor Noon and I had the opportunity to sit with uh, Jay Brandeis and uh, Chris Hooper to talk about their ideas for uh, next phase of community skating opportunities. And I had a meeting this morning um, with Mike Freeland from the Lumbery uh, talking about um, uh, challenges facing small businesses in town. And I also met with former counselor Sarah Lennon, uh, Paul Farrow, and Tony Owens this morning talking about the um, uh, affordable housing amendment uh, proposals and, and town center development proposals. So um, I also want to take a moment to um, acknowledge Deb, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm stealing some of Matt's thunder here from his report, but um, really uh, thank Deb as well as all of the election staff, town staff, school staff, um, all of the different departments that um, uh, we rely on for pulling off uh, our elections so seamlessly. So thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned to Deb and you all saw in my note, I um, you know, know that the turnout was particularly low this year with it being just the single item on the referendum uh, uh, item for the school budget. But um, there, there's no greater service that the town provides than um, holding and carrying out our elections. And so thank you very much for the time and energy and efforts that all put in on that. And i um, very grateful for that. So if nobody has anything else to report, we can move on to the finance committee report. Um, before I turn it over to Jeremy, um, I do want to note, as you all have seen, you know, we do have a pretty substantial agenda before us tonight. So I'm gonna to try to be a little bit more active in moving conversations along. I don't wanna short circuit conversation and discussion unnecessarily, but um, I also am you know, mindful of how much is packed into this agenda. So um, I might be trying to actively manage things a little bit more than, than I usually do. And I'll, I'll say at the outset that I'll try and not be as long-winded and, and uh, verbose myself. So. With that, we'll turn it over to Jeremy and note that there are 14 members of the public that are with us at this point of the meeting. So go ahead, Jeremy. Great, thank you, Jamie. Um, I'll be brief with the finance report. Um, so this is our last, um, well, we'll have one more month of the financial year. Uh, revenues are tracking a little bit ahead of projections in most of the key areas. And uh, we look to be in a strong position to close out the financial year well. So look forward to giving a more complete update in, in July once we have year ends, or at least preliminaries. Um, and then um, also just wanted to note uh, for the benefit of folks who may be watching tonight, that as part of our ongoing discussions around financial management and uh, prudent, you know, use of, of taxpayer resources, uh, the council will be joining the school board tomorrow evening at 630 for a discussion of long range capital project planning um, on both sides of the, the book, if you will. So both town expenses as well as uh, school school department side. That's it for me, unless there are questions. Jamie, you're on mute. Uh, darn it, year and a half into this and we're still doing that. Um, so uh, just a couple of things to add. 
um, I don't know if you, J Jeremy, spoke to um, finance director John Cordero about um, Jen Connors from RKO in doing her um, sort of pre-audit um, work is looking to speak with, uh, she was looking to speak with me, but I wanna, I wanna give everybody else the opportunity to provide input if there are specific areas of the town uh, municipal operations that anyone is interested in um, having be a, a, you know, an area of focus um, beyond what is normally part of the scope of work for the annual audit. Um, just as an example, there have been past years where we've looked a little bit more closely at sort of the cash operations over at the Portland Headlight and Gift Shop. Um, there have been years where we've looked a little bit more closely at some of the cash transactions going on. Um, this is prior to um, most of the transactions turning electronic up at the recycling center. But so those types of things, or if there's, you know, if there's other areas that folks have an interest in, um, uh, please let either myself or Jeremy know, and we'll be setting up um, a preliminary discussion with Jen over at RKO um, sometime in the, in the coming week or two. So um, that, that was one thing I had. And then um, the, uh, just to, to, to reemphasize what Jeremy was saying about the um, sort of longer range capital improvement plan kind of view that's going to be the subject of tomorrow night's meeting. That's really to just sort of look out and see what are the, the layered items that are known things that are coming up and, and no decisioning happening on any of that kind of stuff at this point, but really just to try and take a, a wider and longer view at what some of the um, you know, significant expenses are that are coming down the pike and, and when some existing debt is, is coming off the books. Um, so if anybody has an interest in that, um, that will be the, the point of tomorrow night's discussion. So um, thanks, Jeremy. If, does anybody have any other questions for Jeremy um, pertaining to the finance committee? Okay. Um, now's the point in our meeting where we have an opportunity, the first of two opportunities for citizen comments for things that are not on tonight's agenda. So as I mentioned, we do have a full agenda and I'm sure there'll be comments on a lot of the things that we're gonna be covering tonight. But um, for right now, there's an opportunity for anybody that would like to speak about something that's not on the agenda. So if you are interested in that, please use the uh, raise hand function in the Zoom meeting and we'll queue you up. Um, and I don't see anybody on the phone. I was gonna give the phone instructions too, but I don't see anybody on the phone. Uh, so I don't see any hands going up, so we'll move on from that. And um, uh, the next item is number seven in our agenda. We have Tom Errico from uh, engineering firm TY Lynn joining us tonight. And I think Matt's promoting him up to um, presenter in a moment or uh, panelist rather. And um, so going back to last year, um, we referred an item uh, regarding um, uh, traffic at the town center um, uh, to a workshop and uh, we're getting an update on that this evening from Tom and some of their findings. So Tom, welcome to the meeting. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, uh, again, my name is Tom Eric, who I work for TY Lynn International. We're based in Falmouth. I'm a senior associate um, in the firm. Um, my expertise is traffic engineering and complete streets. And um, I'm gonna share my screen and walk through um, the report that um, I think you probably have seen. Um, everybody see that? And so, and so basically it's been about a year, the pandemic has certainly delayed delayed the presentation of this report, but basically I think that, you know, the findings are still still quite valid. Um, um, you know, basically, basically the purpose, the purpose of the, of the study was to, um, you know, evaluate the Scott Dyer Road, Shore Road, Route 77 intersection, town center intersection, as it relates to providing sort of a balanced review of the intersection. So really considering all users, bikers, pedestrians, cars, large vehicles, really a classic complete street study in terms of the function, functioning of the intersection and also safety. It's been traditionally a high crash location. 
um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, historically, I think many of you probably know it's been an ongoing um, issue for the community and the town. Um, um, it's been it's been on the radar for about 30 years in terms of different studies, whether it be consultants or main DOT, um, about how to solve some of the challenges, um, you know, at the location. Um, um, there have been some, you know, back back in the in the 2000s, uh, there was some sort of I'll say, you know, minor treatment in terms of trying to imp improve mostly pedestrian movements and safety given given the location in, in, in town center and the schools nearby and and and, and the activity that that goes on. Um, you know, you know, quite frankly, a lot of those types of activities have increased. You know, whether it be with, with come on farms and, and as a destination and people crossing the intersection to get there. And so ultimately um, the town wanted to take a new fresh look at, at the location again. Um, you know, we did an existing inventory. Um, I'm not gonna really go through those things, but basically um, um, we, we identified existing conditions from a, from a you know, traffic control perspective, what's on the ground in terms, of, in terms of what's happening. We conducted a traffic count, really important for us to kind of understand what's going on in the intersection. We collected data. Um, back in May 2019, uh, we looked at data from six in the morning to six at night. This graphic goes through the volumes. It's something called a turning movement volume. So we understand how many cars are going left through right um, on all the approaches to the intersection. I'm not going to go through the numbers, but it really serves as an important part of it. We wanted to make sure that we did the count when school was in session, so we did it in May. Um, and then we made some seasonal adjustments. And so we really were able to capture how many vehicles are turning and also how many pedestrians and bicyclists are moving through, through the intersection. And so, so this, this sheet documents some of that. And I can certainly go back to some of this um, if there are questions um, you know, related to it. Um, I talked a little bit about safety problems. As I indicated, this is a high crash location. Main DOT defines a high crash location that has eight or more crashes over a three year period and has a rate um, that is um, um, critical rate factor that is one or more, which is really just a statistic on how it compares to similar type intersections. So this one had a rate of 2.02. .02, so theoretically it's about as a rate two times more crashes when you compare it to other similar type intersections in the state of Maine. Um, and, and if you look at this, we call this a collision or crash diagram. Many of the crashes are really coming off of Scott Dyer and either um, many of them are going into Cumberland Farms. So that was one of the sort of key patterns that, that came out of um, that evaluation. There were 10 overall crashes in the three year period, 2016 to 2018. And so ultimately, ultimately we, um, we had all that baseline information um, and and there, we, we conduct something called a level service analysis that, that basically tells us how well an intersection is performing. Um, and, and sort of the qualitative output is a, is a letter grade, like a school grade card, A being intersection or movement looks really good, works well, F meaning, meaning it's failing. And we looked at basically um, three different scenarios. One, one, do nothing, leave it as is, stop signs on Scott Dyer, Shore Road, um, and, 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 and what this table um, summarizes are, are those letter grades and, and delay. Delay is basically the metric that, that, that feeds into that letter grade. And ultimately, as you can see, the, sh the Shore Road um, intersection um, is not doing so well. It has a level service F, long delays, long queues at times. And again, this is really that sort of a peak hour within the year. So it's, it's, it's one of the higher volume scenarios. So intersection doesn't work well, hard to get out of the side street during peak time periods. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody. It's been, it's been that way um, you know, for a while. So we looked at two different improvement scenarios. Um, one was thinking about increasing the separation, kind of difficult. Difficult one, you know, when I look at, or when we, as engineers, traffic engineers, when we look at intersections, sometimes we like to either line them directly opposite each other. Um, and sometimes we like to try to separate them to help sort of simplify movements so that it's a re so it's less complicated for motorists as they, as they maneuver through the intersection. In this case, because of the difficulty trying to align them, we looked at trying to separate them. And, and really the objective was trying to think about you know, minimizing right away property impacts and how can we do so? And ultimately, I'm gonna just flick back to, 
I'm going to flick to this graphic. This is very rough sort of general concept level stuff, really looking at sort of using space to separate Scott Dyer and Shore Road from each other. And, and really, I'll, I'll say, it's, you know, the key part of doing that is eliminating those teardrop islands that are, in the, that are in the middle of the roadway that don't really serve much purpose. They were sort of design treatments back many years ago. Um, not necessarily, you know, you know, usable or worthwhile space now. So we, by eliminating those teardrop islands and sort of making some geometric changes to sort of creating perpendicular intersections, we're able to separate the two intersections. I mean, certainly not ideal, but better than it is today to help sort of simplify movements. And so when we, when we did that, we found that the intersection from the model perspective, again, this is a traffic model that we employed to look at things, Things work better. Did it? Did it still fail? Yep, still failed. But we saw a reduction of delay, um, you know, of roughly you know 50 percent. So we saw improvement, um, you know, for coming out of Shore Road, and and certainly movements on Mainline Route 77 operate operate pretty well. And so the other, the other um, 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 alternative scenario we looked at was signalization. What happens if you signalize it? That was a proposal many years ago as well. It actually um, meets warrants. There are specific, there's specific criteria that, that both the state and federal highway administration have established to, as to when you can put in a signal and, and you must meet those criteria basically. Um, based upon the data that we have, it does meet warrants. So, um, and, and, it, and it historically has met warrants too. So that, that really isn't surprising. Um, so in essence, you've, you've sort of met one, you've, you've sort of, you know, you've met one element of, of doing it. Um, we modeled that scenario. And so this table, table five presents level of service and, and, and delay, um, you know, assuming a signal is in place. And it's, the results are not, you know, from a traffic engineer, not too surprising. If you're going to stop Route 77 mainline, you're going to increase delay to Route 77 mainline. They're going to see some stops as you let Scott Dyer and Shore Road. And the other complication with the signal under um, an offset configuration, the phasing is a little less efficient because typically you got to move each approach separately. And so you end up actually with some poor movements on, on Route 77. So, so you see the queuing northbound on Route 77, um, you know, you know, approaching almost 700 feet, and so, so, you end up with no Fs, but you have you've you've worsened some 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 delay, um, you know, um, on on Route 77. So ultimately, not a not a, not deemed to be a great thing. So so we sort of took those analysis components and and sort of looked at sort of a pro con. Um, you know, comparison matrix summary as it relates to improving safety, um, you know, and, and, you know, the signal versus intersection separation. Um, and we saw, we saw some, some, some negative and not, you know, not really negative with the signal, but, but that's the other sort of, I'll say counterintuitive element of installing a signal. Many people think that many people think it solves all safety problems, but actually signals actually do create some safety problems in terms of rear collisions. So you may solve some severe cross traffic collisions, but you create some. So that's why that's a, sort of a plus and a minus. Improves mobility. Again, we talked about it. We thought we thought that there was some negative to the fact that you were in, in increasing delay on, on Route 77, um, which which you know you know sort of within the town overall impacts mobility. Cost wise, you know roughly you know roughly the, the same. No build really. There's no cost. Um, community support historically, um, you know, you know, a number of years ago when when the signal was proposed to the town, it got voted down, and so that was, you know, again, I think, you know, you know, that was deemed to be somewhat of a negative. Some both both have positive pedestrian benefits. Um, they're supposed to be really a, a, a negative in the, in the intersection separation bike mode. There really isn't much change from bike bike accommodation facility. Um, um, so, so we, we saw that as sort of a minus or, or no net change and then impact on Cumberland Farms. Um, there is some re related to the separation, I mean, excuse me, related to the signal in terms of, you know, how it, 
how those driveways would operate with a signal, it's likely there would be other restrictions on, on Cumberland Farms where the separation, there's only some slight changes. So ultimately, ultimately the, the recommendation was from the study was um, consider that this intersection separation, restrict movements at the southerly Cumberland Farms driveway so that there are only entry movements going into the facility, no, no exit movements would be permitted. Um, consider adding a crosswalk across 77 between the two intersections as you separate it. So you have a more direct, um, um, you know, route to Cumbies from the corner um, where quite frankly, it's somewhat secured. It's now with just one crosswalk on the Southern side of, uh, um, of, of, of um, uh, Shore Road. And then install something called rectangular rapid flash beacons. And those are sort of strobe flashing lights that really catch the attention of motorists. Right now, they're sort of the old school flashing yellow lights at the subtly crosswalk. So we think sort of stepping up the technology and using the using really um, um, you know safe um, you know research safe uh, technologies for that would, would would make sense. Price tag again to make those you know mostly those geometric changes on those corners. You know just just under you know, you know, 500,000 and that in those were, you know, quite frankly, estimates done a year ago. So probably higher than that, you know, at, at, at this time. So, so I know that was kind of quick, but that's a quick summary, um, you know, of the study. Thank you uh, so much for that uh, overview uh, and for the work. Um, can you remind me when the field work was done? You said it was during, so that was, May of 2019. That's correct. Then? The counts were yeah, done. Okay. Yep, 2019 in May. So prior to the pandemic. Yep. Okay. Um, is there anybody that has any questions or, um, uh, if, you know, at, at this point um, uh, regarding the presentation, and then we can talk about what some potential next steps would be. But I have a question, um, James. Go ahead, I can't see everybody in my current view, so just go ahead and speak up. Um, okay, my question is uh, for that $500,000, probably more investment, what's the lifespan of those solutions? Because um, I will tell you, and I don't think it's just a result of uh, having a year of limited traffic, um, I actually see more traffic movement uh, now than um, probably uh, two years ago. It's it, it's uh, uh, it's significantly noticeable. And in addition to that, the um, um, the 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 number of near misses of accidents at uh, Cumbies seems to be more prevalent also. So I wanna know the lifespan of the solutions. And um, I also think that traffic has increased more than it was in 2019. Sure, good question. So, so typically typically for planning level studies, we do, we do a, um, a future forecast can be a 10 year, 20 year forecast. For this study, I believe we did a forecast to 2039. And basically we looked at 20 years in the future. So I think you're on it. If you're gonna invest this money, what, what are we getting? You know, How long is this, this gonna be effective for? And so we did a 20 year forecast on those volumes. We looked at historic data. Again, this was when we were doing the work a year, two years ago. Um, the growth rate was about a half a percent per year. And so we bumped the numbers up by that growth rate um, to come up with the 2039 volume. Um, and so pretty standard. I can't, I can't comment on, on specifically volumes and, and changing volumes recently. I mean, the pandemic has certainly changed patterns. You know, right. we're seeing t different time of day peaking in, in Maine. Um, you know, I do work throughout, throughout the state with, with different communities. We've seen volumes continue to be, be a little bit less than pre-pandemic conditions. We see volumes that have rebounded and, and almost back to pandemic um, pre-pandemic conditions. It really mm -hmm. does um, vary from, from place to place. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I can look into some data to see if I can find out what's going on 
um, mm -hmm. you know, at this location in terms of changes. Yeah. The other Pen thing is, Penny, can I can I jump in? Because what what as much as last year was an outlier with a drop off, I think this year is equally an outlier with an increase because um, a significant number of the school students are not taking the bus this year and right. are being driven by their parents. Um, so I've been one of those and I've experienced the exact thing that you're talking about. And also the um, uh, much different staggering of dismissal times and things like that has elongated the uh, sort of rush hour, if you will, uh, in both the morning and afternoon so that there's, um, you know, more volume and, and for a longer duration than, you know, would be typical in, in normal setting. So um, I think I think you probably have to throw out, you know, any anything that you would have compared it to from last year, as well as anything from this year, both of them are probably at the extremes of, of um, you know, non-normative. And I think that there would be a, re a regression to the norm starting next year, but. I, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't uh, commenting on the, the school times because I, I knew that was going on. I'm talking about when I'm up here um, at the corner at noontime, one o'clock, 11 o'clock. School's getting, oh. some school, some of the classes are getting out then. Like, oh. I mean, pickups are starting as early as like 1130 for some of the oh. high school and stuff. So it's, it's, it's become more spread out, but which was designed to try and you know, ease the bottleneck, but also just based on the overall increase in volume, it's both, you okay. know, extended, extended the rush hour, like I said, but also added to the volume, so. Can I do a follow-up question? Yeah, go um, ahead. Um, relative to um, the, uh, the lifespan of this type of solution, um, you said increase of whatever number. Can you give me a number versus a, a factor? Like, are we talking, um, uh, if we say 20 years, we're talking that this lifespan can accommodate um, 300 more cars or 200 or 20, or what's the number of, of, uh, of cars or bikes or whatever's? Yeah, that's a good. I can't answer that question. I, I know some sometimes we'll do that calculation. We do we, it's, we call it a sensitivity analysis to figure out you add capacity and how quickly does the capacity go away. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is we added about 10% growth to the volumes in terms of looking at you know how well the intersection would perform under a signalized scenario or the separation scenario. How much is left for capacity? I don't. I, I don't. I don't have that that number. I don't have that number. Hmm. Okay. I have a question, Tom. Go uh, ahead, Councilor Rivera. I'm just curious if you looked at any other alternatives such as um, right turn only off of Scott Dyer. If they wanted to turn left, they'd take Hill. Did you look at anything like that that might um, change the traffic patterns? We, we did not, that did not come up in discussions. You know, you know, we worked closely with the town planner and public works director as we looked at some of these things and we didn't really think about prohibitions. Um, um, and so, no, did not. Okay, but that could possibly change the um, outcome if there were prohibitions. Because you said a lot of it was people turning left into Cumbies if they could only turn right there, would that possibly make changes also? Yeah, you know, I, I, I tell people I tell people that I am not a big fan, not just me, but but you know you know if you're going to make if you're going to implement restrictions to certain turn movement, movements, it's more than just a sign that's installed that says no left turn. It's it's typically physical improvements that would physically can you know constrain the movement or, or or restrict that movement? And so, if you there's no question, left turn movements from a stop sign onto a you know arterial roadway, Route 77, are the hardest movements. You restrict those, um, the intersection is going to work better. The question is, where do they go? How do they go? What impact does that have in terms of diversion? 
And eventually they're going to have to make a left from another location and maybe a better location and maybe a safer location, but sometimes the diversion creates other problems that would have to be evaluated. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments from anybody? So um, we, we don't, just so folks are aware, I mean, we, we don't have anything currently actively planned for, th this is all fact finding and information gathering. Um, there's, there's nothing currently budgeted or scoped or anything like that. Um, you know, this is all work that was done to try and, um, you know, assess the um, sort of the size of the problem and take it from being more, um, you know, folks' anecdotal observations um, to something that was, you know, more precisely um, diagnosed with a set of data. So um, I don't anticipate anything immediately coming from this. I am guessing that we'll plan to schedule some future workshops to, to further talk about um, where to go from here, whether or not there's any additional study that's needed, um, or whether or not what we have here is sufficient. Um, and then, like I was talking about during the finance committee report, um, probably some discussion, um, you know, starting as early as tomorrow's meeting, but in subsequent meetings around, okay, well, what would a project like that and that cost um, mean in terms of impact and, and how it's slotted uh, in terms of priority uh, based on other, um, you know, fiscal demands. So um, just so folks that are seeing this have some sense of, um, you know, expectation setting and uh, expectation management. Um, I just wanted to add that. Matt, I don't know if you have any other thoughts that you want to add before we move off of this or? Uh, that, that's precisely uh, precisely why we brought this forward, Mr. Chairman, uh, was to get this on the radar, uh, at least for discussion. Possibly the best time to come back for workshop would be in the fall uh, as we go into, uh, you know, uh, planning for next year, uh, potentially, and, and seeing where this would rank in, in relationship to that. Uh, it's just, it, it's a study that we did have done and Tom did a great job of it. And we had a, a couple of, a couple of times during the past year uh, that we had tentatively scheduled, but uh, as you know, uh, from life experience this past year has provided its own set of challenges. So that's why we brought this forward tonight, just to uh, bring the council as an update and part of our discussion this spring regarding uh, council goals as well to, to try to circle back and advancing those goals. So uh, that's why we brought it forward this evening. Great. Um, Tom, was there anything you wanted to add in conclusion or? Oh, I think, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for yours and your, uh, team's work on this and, uh, for bringing it back to us. Um, we appreciate the information and we'll look forward to continued discussion on, uh, you know, potential next steps and, and, uh, way forward on this. So. Thanks for having me. Great. Have a good evening. Okay. Thanks, take Tom. care. Okay, uh, so the next item, uh, we'll turn it over to Matt for his monthly report from the manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so as uh, Councilor Gabrielson had spoken during the finance report, as the fiscal year comes to a close, the council will be pleased to know that the fiscal health of the town is robust. Property tax collection is currently at 99.64% of the anticipated amounts, which is 0.13% greater than the average amount collected at this time historically. Uh, additionally, excise taxes are at 114% of anticipated revenue. With just over two weeks remaining in the month, we're looking at coming at well above what our forecast was. Building permit revenue is also at a historic revenue level. While expenditures are, are at less than anticipated due to a mild winter helping us with many different areas from, from overtime to salt and sand and other operation expenses. This is all to say, in comparison to where the town was last year at this time, with significant uncertainty in many areas, the town has weathered the pandemic very well financially. My thanks is extended to the many department heads and frontline employees for their hard work to accomplish this as a goal for fiscal year 21, as well as the support from the council. As we prepare to close the fiscal year and begin fiscal year 22, the tax office will be closed at noon on June 30th to close the books and be ready to start the new year the next day on July 1st. Also on July 1st, the new short-term rental zoning amendments become effective. 
I'm sure you all remember that fondly. Applications are coming in to the Code Enforcement Office and the short-term rental monitoring service in use by the town will be sending out correspondence to those offering short-term rentals in Cape Elizabeth to remind them of the requirement to have a permit to legally operate. The town's website now has a lead story regarding the new regulation, which links you to a new short-term rental page on the site. Thank you to Suzanne and Lizelle Hubs for her assistance on that. She did a great job and it's very user-friendly. The page has a link to the application, frequently asked questions, a link to applying for homestead exemptions and other needed details for short-term rentals. Very user-friendly and we're happy to help if people have other challenges getting through the process. On this coming Monday, June 21st, community service summer camp begins and there are approximately 185 campers attending. That is the largest that they've had. It's a full house. The camp will be mask optional as of June 1st due to the recent executive decision by Governor Mills. However, the camp will still strictly adhere to the cleaning and sanitizing processes established last summer. Here's hoping to another safe and fun filled summer for the campers. And then finally, if you are on Shore Road and you happen to notice that there are now blue markings and yellow markings, do not be, do not be worried. Those are markings for water lines as well as for gas lines in anticipation for working on the planning and engineering for the Shore Road project uh, that we have going forward. So th that's all part of the utility uh, identification as well as we'll be having surveyors out uh, later, uh, later this summer. And uh, sh shortly you should see probably the town planner town's engineer and a number of others uh, walking through to identify additional elements. So uh, happy to take any questions, but that would be my full report this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Does anybody have any questions for the manager? Okay, seeing none, um, we will move on to item number nine, which is a review of the draft minutes of the May 3rd special meeting and the May 10th regular meeting. Is there anybody that would like to make a motion on those minutes? So moved. Councilor, Bush oh, Councilor Jordan, I saw uh, Councilor Boucher's hand go up. Is that a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Deb, could you call the roll for the vote, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, item number 10 on our agenda is a consent calendar, including items number 91-2021 through item number 94-2021. Uh, these items are an acceptance of a safety enhancement grant for the Public Works Department, the uh, amendments to the purchasing policy, uh, and uh, what we called our policy on policies, uh, which we've discussed at workshop and previous meeting, um, as well as an actual request for short-term borrowing uh, for the school construction um, project um, uh, planning work. Uh, that is pursuant to the previous item that we had approved allowing uh, for that type of short-term financing to occur. So this is the specific request. And then the last is the amendments to the Thomas Memorial Library policies that we also looked at at workshop last week. Do any counselors wish to pull any of these items out of the consent calendar for uh, voting on separately? I see Councillor Noonan's hand going up. Which of the items, Councillor yeah. Noonan? Um, number 94-2021, that's the library. The library. Yep. Okay, uh, anything else? I see no other hands. Are there any members from the public then that wish to speak on any of the first three items? Again, it's the public safety, it's the um, uh, safety grant for the public works department, um, purchasing policy and other policy item and the short-term borrowing um, that will be going to the school department. Uh, if you are interested in speaking on any of those three items, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting and you'll be called on. I don't see any hands going up for those items. So would somebody uh, like to make a motion? I'll 
I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, <clears throat> I move that we um, accept items 91 2021 through 93 2021 as outlined in the agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Noonan. Any discussion on those from councilors? I just want to uh, reiterate our thanks to uh, the finance director um, and uh, uh, appreciation for the work on all, all the three of the things connected to 92 and 93. Uh, so thank you very much for that, John. Uh, I think I saw him in the list of attendees earlier. Uh, so if there's no further discussion, um, if we could have the roll call again, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, so left over from that is item number 94-2021. It is the recommended amendments that we discussed with the library director and members of the library committee in our workshop last week. Uh, I'm not sure if I saw, I do see the library directors here, Matt, maybe if you wanna promote her up to um, uh, panelists, just in case there are questions or discussion points. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna ask if there's anybody from the public that uh, would like to talk about the library policy amendments. Um, now's your opportunity to do that. I don't see any hands going up. So um, is there anybody from the council that would like to make a motion on this item to get us going? I'll make a motion. Okay, you're busy tonight, Penny. Well, I'm trying to move this agenda, come on. Um, I move that uh, we accept the recommendations from the Thomas Memorial Library Committee to amend and establish the following policies, including general use policies, food and beverage policies, computer use and internet policy, and safe child and vulnerable adults policy, effective immediately. I'll second that. Seconded by Council Devereaux. Is there any discussion? Or um, as I said, we have the library director here. There's any additional questions or, or discussion with her? So go ahead, Councilor Noonan. I saw your hand. Go ahead. Super. Thanks. So um, as we talked about last time, you know, it seems like the main issue in terms of the age is the large groups of kids, especially probably I'm guessing, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh graders that are congregating. Um, and we had discussed having an alternative place for them to congregate, which I think is a really great idea. It seemed like there was a lot of enthusiasm for that. Um, at the end of the meeting, it was sort of expressed that it's okay to go ahead and vote on this when we don't have something set up, but I think that I'm feeling some disagreement with that. I'd really like to know. Um, I know summer's coming up, school's done tomorrow. You know, hopefully it's not an issue, but I just feel uncomfortable voting for this, not knowing what our alternative is going to be. Um, I also would like to think that if we do find an alternative place for kids to hang out, that maybe we wouldn't need this after all. Um, I think the library staff had said, that they do have some kids that come in after school to actually use the library in an appropriate manner. They wanna do homework or find a book or use the computers. Um, and they get kind of swept up when they see all their peers in a big group. Um, I'm hopeful that if we could move the group out of there that those kids that wanna use the library could still come in and do that. Um, I think as I said last time, I think 12 year olds and probably most 11 year olds are uh, maybe in the absence of a large group of peers, perfectly capable of being in the library by themselves. Um, so I guess I would like to suggest that I'm fine with the other ones, um, general use, the computers. Um, I personally would feel more comfortable if we waited to vote on the age until we had an alternative set up and just see how it worked. Um, and hopefully maybe we could not have to do that after all, so. Thank you, Councilor Noonan. Are there other thoughts, other points of view from other councilors?
Go ahead, Councillor Boucher. Yeah, I would just like to echo that, like coming back from COVID is probably a great opportunity to keep reinforcing rules. You know, we talked about taking away the video game room and maybe like retraining on how uh, what's proper use of a library now that we're back, just like the schools had to teach six feet apart and, oh, okay, we're going to four days a week. We need to retrain how to do school. Um, not that I'm against all of the policies or anything like that. I think they were great policies were in, but where it comes in particular with the the age and and not having another place for um, preteens to go, it, it definitely feels like I don't know. I I almost feel like we need more data on how things will be after COVID with some other enforcement techniques. Uh, okay, thanks, um, Penny. Go ahead. Um, I. I understand uh, where uh, Gretchen is coming from. Uh, and I too, I think at the end of the last meeting said I'd kind of like to know what our solution is going to be. My question to you, Matt, is uh, I understood that what you said uh, at, the, at our workshop is that uh, there's programming that is available for that age group like during the summer. So we, uh, we have this kind of uh, hiatus where uh, summertime is here, but maybe what we need to do is um, Gretchen's recommendation is to put the age one on hold for a short period of time while we spend the summer trying to figure out the solution to that um, opportunity that we have to create space for young people in town to gather. Um, I'd like to call on the library director for a minute because I know um, when we met about this in workshop, um, we discussed at length uh, as, as Councillor Noonan alluded to, you know, school's out tomorrow. So the sort of major source of the, the uh, challenge, um, you know, sort of self alleviates um, for a couple of months at least. Um, and I remember that, um, Rachel, you were saying that, um, you know, you were, you, even though the changes would be effective immediately, the, the major focus would be obviously on this one in particular, more into the fall um, with a lot of communication and education going on between now and then um, to try and, um, you know, help with public awareness and things like that. So my question is, as far as any of the other things go, if we were to consider just um, laying this entire item on the table tonight, having a second workshop discussion about it and coming back to revisit it at a subsequent meeting, um, is that any way you know problematic for for your from your perspective from from an operations point of view? Um, yes, it is problematic, and okay. and the reason being that what I hear you saying is that the library should continue to provide a um, illusion of childcare until there's another alternative. What I feel is happening and, and what was demonstrated to me quite clearly, yes, uh, on Friday when I had a call from a parent um, wanting to, uh, wanting me to, to find his 10-year-old son and tell him to come to the phone so that he could tell him that he was running late, um, is that the reason that the kids of this age are at the library after school is because their parents deem that they are too young to ride the bus and be home alone. And because if, that, if they were able to just take the bus and go home, there wouldn't be a need for a place for them to go. So I feel that there is a, a misconception among parents that the library is a safe place that is in lieu of childcare or in lieu of having their child be at home alone. And perhaps the reasons that they feel their children are too young to be on their own at home alone is they're worried about strangers coming to the door. They're worried about 
the child maybe falling down, having an accident in the house and not being able to get help. They may be worried about um, too much screen time or the child is not gonna, you know, is gonna eat too many snacks. All of these things are, are problematic at the library and in an amplified way. So my concern is that I, I don't want the, the library to be seen as a substitute for childcare until there can be some other thing in the, in, put in place. Um, so so it's, it's really a safety issue. It's not that this is just a burden on the staff, but it's a problematic use of the library and an, and an inappropriate use of the library. Um, so, it, and it's not simply groups of kids. There are kids, a, a child um, who might be there by themselves behaving. They're surrounded by people coming and going. Um, we, we, it, it's, if they're too young to be at home alone, they're too young to be in the library alone. Rachel, thank you for all of that. I uh, appreciate that. I, I guess I should have been a little bit more specific with my question around waiting and it was not sort of waiting indefinitely, but like if we voted on this at our July meeting, for example, as opposed to this evening, um, is that specifically, um, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying about any day more though, you know, again, acknowledging that school letting out tomorrow, I don't, I don't know if, kids come over from rec camp or not, or if that's just not as frequent. Um, but um, it, it was merely just a question about whether or not um, if the council felt that there was a need for just additional discussion in a workshop setting on this, um, if waiting until the July meeting would be prohibitively um, disruptive to you, so. I see, I understand. Um, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm certainly, um, I think that would be fine to have an, another workshop. Um, yeah. It's it's a little difficult uh, being in a position of, of not having the policy in place and, and kind of have it, encountering kids alone in the library um, and not having a, a way to follow up on that. But if it's just a matter of waiting till next month and having another workshop that, that I, I'm sure that we can make that work. Great. Um, I. You know, I would. I think it's extremely unlikely that we're going to have uh, a fully baked solution that's a replacement for this um, uh, any time in the immediate near future. Um, it's going to take you know a lot more sort of discussion and ideation um, amongst multiple staff people and and things like that. Um, and frankly, some planning that might involve you know a, a, you know allocating some budget towards it too. So. Um, so I, I think it, were we to wait, we'd be um, sort of waiting indefinitely, which I, I don't think is um, appropriate. Um, and I, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't even at this point have um, a realistic time frame to put on. Well, we th we think we could have a solution as a replacement in six months or something like that. Because I, I having, you know, only just last workshop brought up the idea of of doing something like that in response to what. You know, was brought forward to us as the nature of the, the concern and issue at the library. I think I think a lot more time and effort is going to need to be put on that. So um, whether or not other counselors feel comfortable then voting on these policy changes now and still working that concurrently, or um, again, I, I think you know, we, we could have a subsequent discussion to hone in more specifically on that one item uh, and then bring this whole thing back around in July. Either of those, I think, are viable options. So we have a current motion on the table to approve the amendments as they are. Is there any other discussion um, or a potential motion to lay this on the table? Councilor Devereaux. I, I agree. I don't think waiting is a, appropriate. This is something that needs to be taken care of now and dealt with now. It's. Um, kids need supervision and it's not the library's responsibility. It's um, difficult. It, it's very, very difficult. And I'm coming, saying this as a single parent, I, I know how difficult it is. However, um, this is also a huge safety issue. If it was, uh, if they were being dropped off at the community center or at the pool, 
we'd have the same, we'd be talking about the same thing. There's rules, they're not being dropped off at um, town hall. This is, this is the library and it's not a childcare center. So I think that um, it's really important that, that we vote on this today and we talk about other options such as community center, after school programs, something that the school can talk about, but the library really needs a policy and kids need to be protected. And, um, staying alone at the library, it's like dropping them off at the mall. It's just not safe. And I think that we're doing a disservice by um, allowing that to continue. Um, Matt, it, it, are you aware of any specific liability exposure that the town would would be at risk for if god forbid you know some worst case scenario happened with, yeah. with a child yeah i do not believe that we have uh, any additional greater risk than we do you know than we would normally uh, but we do have coverage for uh, if anything untoward had happened at the library so uh the one thing i would just say uh, looking at the discussion is i think we've got some time to work with staff over the summer uh, community services has a great and very creative programming staff and i'd like to give them the opportunity to come forward with an idea uh, the other thing is you know having at one time been 11 12 13 sometimes <laughs> this programming you want to do and there's you know there can be a ton of really cool programming available and then there's times when you're just hanging out uh and i know it kind of sounds funny to say it like that but uh, we would, you know, we do a really good job. I know Kelly Finney does and, and Kathy Raftis to come up with creative programming. It may be a question of finding, you know, finding something where it's not a, a sign in, sign out. It's more like a drop in according, you know, have some rules. But if we have some time over the summer, I know we can come up with some creative approaches that may that may step into the void that that would be created here. And we're, I know we're happy to do that as well. Um, Rachel, I see your hand raised. Did you want to add a comment and then Penny? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I my hand actually, oh, okay. I, yep. I just didn't turn no it down. I'm, I'm... Go ahead, Penny. Um, my gosh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, what was I going to say? It was really profound. I just want you to know. Um, my question, <laughs> my question is, um, is there a way, it came back to me, um, is there a way that we could start uh, communication with parents now so that as we look toward, uh, because it, it looks like this is the road we're going to travel, similar to how we did the short-term rentals. We gave people some uh, notice that said, uh, here's, here's what's potentially coming. So we could start that communication um, uh, with parents about what changes uh, are to be anticipated within the library, something along those lines. Uh, if I may respond to that, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I know uh, Rachel and the library staff will do their outreach that they need to do. And I think uh, Council Noonan had, uh, had pointed out last time, you know, the two different uh, parent associations at Pond Cove, as well as at the middle school, uh, those, and those are great. They're the great organizations to work through to get the word out uh, extremely well, as well as our other opportunities we have through our own network here. So uh, I know they've they've been very successful in messaging. So I think uh, you know we'll try to get the word out that way as well, uh, well in advance. Yeah, and just to fill in the gaps for anybody that is either watching now or watches this back later, um, you know the thing that we talked about in our workshop last week with Rachel. Um, you know, around this around this concern that she brought forward and, and the reason why it's addressed in the policy changes was the idea that there's this sort of couple of year, uh, you know, early teen, tween kind of cohort that they've, they've sort of aged out of some of the traditional community services programming that we've been offering and don't find it to be as appealing anymore, yet they're not into the high school and doing as many independent things and other after school activities and stuff like that. And, how do we find something that is age appropriate for them and, and something that's appealing and have it be just an alternative to basically what's, um, you know, developed over time as um, sort of a de facto, um, you know, kid hangout uh, at the library and, and, and unsupervised childcare. So um, other 
comments that anybody wants to add before we try and move this forward? Council Noonan. Thanks, Jamie. So um, how would it work to have two motions on the floor? Because I don't disagree with what Valerie had to say, but my only concern is that by making the age limit 13, we are eliminating kids that are capable of being alone. So I, I, I would propose moving it to a workshop where we could discuss, you know, maybe making it 10 and then doing more to communicate with the parents of kids that are in that 11 and 12 range because um I yeah I agree that someone who can't be home alone shouldn't be home uh, shouldn't be at the library alone either but I think we are discouraging some kids who are capable of using the library by themselves from coming there so I I, I would personally really um appreciate the opportunity to to hash it out a little more so I don't know if we yeah. can have competing motions or no so the order of operation would be if, if you if you would like to make a motion to lay this on the table to our July um, meeting, our July regular meeting, and um, refer the item for further discussion to a workshop. So yes, that would be the motion I would make. Okay. Um, is it seconded by Councilor Gabrielson? There's no debate on a motion to lay on the table. So could we call the roll for that, please? I'm just, uh, we're voting on the motion already on the table, correct? We're voting no. to lay this on the table, to table this to our July meeting and have a... We already have a motion pending that- uh, A motion to table in Robert's rules supersedes the original motion. So the, the motion now is whether or not to table this item. Okay. Um, a motion to table does not include debate and is not uh, also able to be um, revisited um, or reconsidered. So, um, so we have a motion to table and a second on that motion. So Deb, if you could call the roll for the motion to table the item. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? No. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries 68 one day. And Deb, just to make sure that the, the motion and the minutes reflect that that's for bringing back to our July meeting, not for an indefinite um, tabling, so. Yes, indeed, yes. Thank you so much. Rachel, thank you for participating and joining in the meeting tonight. And um, thank you for the work uh, from you and the committee um, to make all the other adjustments. And we will work um, diligently to try and you know, make progress and get this move forward um, in the way that you need. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I just ask yep. you, uh, just for uh, scheduling points, uh, so I don't mess yep. up my calendar once again. <laughs> All right, what are you uh, thinking for uh, workshop for uh, for this item? The council meeting is scheduled for July uh, July twelfth. So, uh, yeah, would you like to do it the the uh, week of the fifth or uh, or the week before is July the month that we don't specifically have a workshop schedule yes sir okay um, can we take this item on scheduling a workshop just later or or yep. I, I don't want to hold up the rest of the agenda yep we can circle yeah. back at the end let's, of the agenda yeah let's do that and we'll just we'll just figure out when to book the the workshop for and and make sure that it works for everybody but um, why don't we just keep moving ahead and Come Perfect. back to that as a lower priority. Thanks, Thank though. I for, I forgot that we do not have a July scheduled um, workshop, but we'll make sure we get one scheduled. So, um, okay. Next up is item number ninety five dash two zero two one, which is fifteen on our agenda, and that is the recommendation from the ordinance committee uh, relating to the creation of a new standing committee that would be known as the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, we have uh, opportunity now for anybody from the public that would like to speak on this. Um, so you know the intended action um, for this evening, uh, though we're happy to have some level of discussion on it, is a bit administrative where we're really just looking to set to a public hearing, uh, which is required because of it being um, a change to ordinance, uh, that we would have a public hearing on this at our Monday, July 12th meeting with an opportunity for folks to discuss and then presumably vote on it at that meeting. Um, so. Um, no um, specific action to approve the recommendation or anything tonight, but if folks do have any comments they want to offer at this time, I would welcome them from the public. Just use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting.
I don't see any hands going up. Um, uh, would anybody, uh, Council Jordan or anybody from the Ordinance Committee like to um, just give any quick uh, intro or overview uh, before we look for a motion to refer this to a, uh, to a public hearing rather? I, I'll, I'll go. I think most of you were in attendance at that uh, meeting. Basically, what we did is we I, um, um, sought to align it with um, how other uh, standing committees are uh, set up. And what was really good is that we had uh, members of the um, existing Civil Rights Committee um, really participate in helping to craft uh, what the um, uh, membership purpose and uh, kind of duties are of this committee. So uh, I think uh, it pretty much uh, encompasses what the group had put forward as their recommendation from the civil rights group. So. Okay. Uh, so would you like to make a motion, Penny? I'd like to move that we uh, uh, move this to our, our public hearing at our July 12th, 2021 um, council meeting. Great, is there a second? I'll second that. Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? See, oh, go ahead, Matt. Chairman, just uh, one, just more of a housekeeping question. On that evening, would you like us to also, anticipating a positive vote, would you like us to also schedule that uh, for acceptance as the subsequent item on the agenda that evening or uh, generally that's taken place, but also sometimes you take action the following yep. month, but uh, if yep. you're good, we can schedule that. Vote on, I think this would be one we'd vote on at the same meeting, so. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Yep, and then we, we can get um, synced up with the appointments committee process that comes in the late summer and early fall. So I think that'll keep everything on a good um, coordinated timeline if, uh, if things decide to move forward, so. Great. Um, so motion by Penny, uh, second by Councilor Devereaux. Any discussion from anybody else? Seeing none, Deb, could we have the roll call for this vote, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. And the motion carries. Great. Um, next up is number 96-2021, which is number 16 on the agenda. It's the uh, Fort Williams Park Master Plan Recommendations Overview with uh, members of the Fort Williams Park Committee uh, providing us a, an overview and seeking some of our input um, as they continue their work on updates to the master plan. Um, we will have an opportunity for public comment on this, but I'm thinking that it might be best to, to do that overview first so that folks have a good idea of what we're talking about. And then, uh, then I'll turn to the public for, um, for comment and questions before we go into council uh, action. So I see um, Jim Kearney uh, promoted up to panelist um, from the Fort Williams Park Committee and um, uh, consultant from Richardson's Associate, Richardson Associate. So Jim and, and uh, folks, do you want to introduce yourself and then give us a little overview? Sure. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jim Kearney. I currently serve as the chair of the Fort Williams Park Committee. Um, and I've got Todd Richardson on the line with me and maybe uh, several, other, uh, several other of our committee members as well. So uh, Todd is of uh, Richardson Associates and they have been our partner in the couple year uh, long process that we're in right now to uh, get the master plan updated. So just kind of for overall edification here, the Fort Williams Park master plan has served as our kind of our guiding roadmap for decades now. It's what helps us with the stewardship of the park relative to historic scenic and natural elements that we're, we're working on in the park. It guides our maintenance policies, both on preservation as well as on safety items. And it also is what guides our longer term investment policy as we look at uh, uh, new projects that are needed uh, within the park. So that's why it's such an important document, something we do try to keep updated. 
Right now, we are in the process of wrapping up the uh, Fort Williams Park Master Plan Update 2021. The last ones were done in 2003 and 2011. Um, the uh, purpose of tonight's meeting is really to, to get to give you all an update on our progress thus far. And as you said, uh, Chairman Garvin, to solicit uh, feedback and recommendations as we move forward and then figure out what you think our next steps should be, whether that's a, a, a workshop or, or, or kind of next review of uh, the document thus far. So all the documentation is online from the uh, executive summary to the recommendations and, and multiple appendices as well. So hopefully you've had a chance to look through some of that. So we're two years into this process. We've had, uh, it's been a very uh, public process. We've had over 22 public meetings, stakeholder workshops. We've done uh, public forums and then um, even on-site uh, workshops as we had to you know, specifically examine different parts of the park. Uh, we've done a use case workshops and then extensive documentation, traffic uh, analysis studies. Um, and uh, we also did, uh, as we kicked off the project, um, under the tutelage of Richardson and Associates, we did a uh, public survey where we had over uh, 600 uh, respondents and exclusive of those respondents, I'd say that close to 100 other members of the public participated in this process so far. So lo lots of involvement. Uh, we're always up for more, but I think it's been a, a very open um, process. The um, safety has always been the underwriting guiding factor of the work that the committee does. And with that in mind, we developed three goals for this set of, uh, of our master plan update. Uh, the first one is to prioritize and enhance Fort Williams Park for the year round enjoyment of all local residents. I'll just quickly point out that, uh, that we underscore the concept of year round and underscore the concept of local. And that's something we really haven't seen as part of the planning process recently. The second one is to advance safe access, circulation and way finding for all of our guests. And then finally, the third one is to preserve, protect, promote, and enhance Fort Williams Park natural, scenic, and historic resources. With that in mind, we um, went through the survey process, got feedback from the committee, and most importantly, got feedback from our new uh, vendor, Richardson and Associates, to put together over 100 recommendations, which the, the uh, committee then each ranked all 100 of those recommendations kind of after an ex extensive review of each of the uh, extensive public review of each of those. Uh, so we ranked them privately, then we ranked them, you know, as individuals, then we talked about those rankings in public and re ranked them all and narrowed that group down to 78 individual recommendations. And our ranking guidelines are our ranking guidelines are in the uh, executive summary that's been provided to you all. Um, I would say that the survey results helped guide us in a lot of those recommendations. I'll just give you a real quick update. There were, there were literally over a thousand write in comments in addition to all of the answers on the 30 plus multiple uh, choice questions that were on the survey. Uh, number one was there is a, uh, a, a request from our residents that we emphasize uh, uh, local use, which is why you saw that in our top goal. And we also emphasize year round use of the park as opposed to it really being a uh, seasonal facility. Um, there was a strong desire that we not focus any, any energy on building a welcome center. But at the same time, there was an equally strong desire to have enhanced and or permanent restrooms. So those seemingly are in conflict with one another, but we have some uh, concepts around that. Um, a lot of uh, folks, uh, number two desire of coming out of the survey was that we make, uh, make enhancements to the pond. So that's the dam, the stone walls, the skating facility, um, the filtration system that feeds the upper pond. So uh, lots of focus on that. And then um, another uh, kind of concept that was thematic throughout the thoughts was that we as a town should not be building any additional resources within the park that we don't have the capability, the funding, the manpower to maintain, and that we should not over groom the park. I mean, they want people want to see enhancements over time, but they don't want it to be the, you know, everything perfectly combed and groomed out. So that's kind of the 
general themes, lots of more detail in the study, but trying to try to give you just a, a quick overview of the, the comments coming out of the survey. The park, um, Richardson and Associates divided the park into a number of distinct areas, and we have specific recommendations for each of those areas that we will find in the documentation. There are a handful of recommendations that span all of those areas. So I'll go through those very quickly. The first one is really about the lawns and the quality of the lawns and improving the lawns, filling the holes, removing old concrete and pavement that pops out of the lawn where there used to be um, uh, you know, buildings from when it was a fort. Um, the second one is on improving the visual, I guess, sanitary and hygienic um, experience for our outhouses. And I spoke uh, to the request for um, some sort of permanent or enhanced uh, um, restroom facilities. Uh, the next one is to do a better job with the pathways um, throughout the park to improve the north-south orientation. Right now, everything is pretty much east and west from shore road to the ocean, not north and south um, from residential to residential area to improve the walking promenades and to do a better job uh, linking our signages and, uh, signage and wayfinding within the park. Um, we have a strong focus now on invasive species, historic repairs, which are the batteries, walls, and buildings. People want that work and the work that we're doing on erosion control within the park to continue. And then uh, finally, strong emphasis um, on uh, us doing a better job enforcing the speed, parking, trash, and lease policies within the park. And we know that there are vocal groups uh, in each of those areas. So those are the kind of the the cross park, trans park uh, recommendations that are outlined in the survey. In addition to that, there are many, many other recommendations, but there are probably 10 major recommendations that I wanna point out quickly. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Todd take you through a couple of those to give you a sense. The first one is to, uh, and a lot of feedback on this one, to improve the safety of Powers Road. And Powers Road is the central artery and entrance into the park. It then fills into each of the different parking areas down to Captain Stroud Circle and up to the uh, all of the buildings by Officers Row. The next one is to enhance the entire Ship Cove area. So that's the, the playground, the parking area, the lawn and the beach. And we've got some great ideas around that. Um, to stabilize and enhance Goddard Mansion would be the next one. And we've got some, um, we've got some drawings and concepts around a uh, how they, how Bermuda has um, handled their unfinished church. For those of you who have been there and seen that, that might be a great model for the Goddard Mansion. Same thing on Battery Keys, which is the northernmost battery um, within the park closest to Portland, stabilize enhanced Battery Keys. Uh, we feel that we need to, from a safety perspective, re-engineer the parade ground and overflow parking, which is much more heavily used now than it ever was in the past and has created some safety challenges there. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the pond, the walls, the filter, the pond walls, the filtration system, the pump system, and even establishing a uh, pavilion around the pond for uh, seasonal use, or actually for four season use. Um, improving the trail systems would be another one, and with special emphasis on connecting the cliff walk to the north and to the south of the Portland headlights. We've got great cliff walks, but there's no real continuity within the park um, relative to those cliff walks. Um, uh, a big one be, would be to create a centralized vendor area or a pavilion. So that's not only for our food vendors, but for the expressive arts. And we, would, uh, we think the best choice for doing that is at the north end of the stone wall underneath Battery Blair. And then the next one is to create a mini theater underneath the other end of Battery Blair. So if you will, the, you know, towards Delano Park and where they've just done all of the um, work around the, the uh, battery up there. So there's a great little natural alcove there on that uh, lawn, kind of near the finish of the Beach to Beacon. It'd be a great uh, location for a uh, small theater to be used as a classroom. And then finally, and probably the, the biggest long-term project would be to start establishing a plan for a Cape community campus within the fort and using or leveraging the existing buildings that we have within the, within the park. 
So I, I know that's a lot to run through. Um, I know you're also on a very fixed time frame tonight. So what I want to do is to ask Todd to quickly address through some schematics and a discussion, the Powers Road, the Pond, and the Cape Community Campus. And then I thought we could open up for, uh, for questions. So with that, and unless there's any questions on the process piece of what I just took you through quickly, I'd like to turn it over to Todd, and I think he's going to want to share his screen with, with you and your team. Great, Jim, thanks. And go ahead, Todd, whenever you're set here. Hey, terrific. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Jim gave an outstanding overview of the, of the project and the work that we've done, and I'm going to focus on some of these three key areas and show you some of the plans. This is the overall master plan, and Jim alluded to both short-term and long-term recommendations throughout the park that have different levels and degrees of investment and different levels of priority. Uh, but here's that overview of the overall master plan. And the three areas that I'm gonna focus on, uh, as Jim alluded to, is the Powers Road corridor, which is an important artery or way in which people move into and through the park that's really critical and important and some of the focus on safety there. And then uh, the pond area, if you can see my cursor down over here, and then uh, this area where there's a lot of the existing buildings that exist there right now. So we'll move through that. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen here, uh, I wanna focus on the Powers Road changes and what the team had come up with after field observations and several of the community group meetings, user group meetings, and the survey that there are a number of places where safety issues and concerns exist. So uh, those being primarily between pedestrians and automobiles. So the plan calls for a number of different places where uh, we're encouraging a more detailed engineering study to look at horizontal and vertical alignments, crosswalks, curbs, and sight lines, as well as the integration of uh, bikes sharing the road as well. And I'll just point out uh, two uh, areas that are within this Powers Road corridor. One is this area A where uh, the alignment of this would um, potentially increase the opportunity of a greater separation between pedestrians and cars in this critical area where they're uh, run parallel to each other. <clears throat> and then the image on the right um, looks at some of the circulation down at uh, down by the lighthouse. And one of the primary things that's being recommended would be that Powers Road um, sweep down into central parking where there would be a one way out in this particular location. And what that's attempting to do is um, minimize the extent of circulation and traffic that immediately turns left and comes down to the lighthouse, encouraging people to use central parking and then move down and increase and improve promenade to the lighthouse uh, in that direction. So uh, let me move on to the next uh, area being the pond area. And uh, this is a really unique area of, of the park that's away from the waterfront itself. And Jim alluded to some of the things that we're suggesting. Here's a plan that shows uh, the introduction of a number of things. One would be uh, the identification of repairs that are needed to the physical containment of the pond, as well as the mechanical systems that are in disrepair and can be improved. The other is a perimeter pathway that would uh, move around the pond with associated seating areas and uh, native plantings. And then uh, a highlight of this new area would be a pavilion or warming hut that would be used year round with an adjacent gathering area in front of it uh, next to the pond, which would um, be great year round, but also particularly for the winter months for outdoor skating. The last area that I'm going to talk to is this Cape Community Campus that Jim referred to, and it um, is really looking at the adaptive reuse of some of the existing structures that would focus on those types of community um, uh, entities and organizations that would potentially be associated with uses within the park itself. So here's an aerial photograph here of that area. Uh, currently, there's a, a playground within the middle of this area that is being recommended to be relocated. And just briefly, here is, oh, sorry about that. Um, here's the plan uh, for that particular area. So I won't go into details, but 
Um, it would encourage um, the consideration of alternative uses of the buildings. It would reconfigure the parking to be much more efficient. And it would include a series of outdoor spaces or courtyards um, within this campus where there could be outdoor uses with a focus on pedestrian safety and movement into and through this area and then connections to adjacent areas such as the Southwest Preserve and the sports or athletic fields um, and other areas of the park beyond. So I know that probably felt rushed to everybody but um, certainly welcome any thoughts and comments on those three areas uh, if there are any. Um, thank you so much, Todd. Uh, does, I still will um, make available the opportunity for public comment, um, but real quick, are there just any any um, top of mind questions that anybody has that they wanna um, get any clarification from or go further into detail on what was just presented? The intended action here is that we're, I think, going to be referring this to um, a workshop uh, to um, get into a much more thorough discussion. But while we have both Jim and, and Todd here, um, just in case anybody had any questions, is there anybody from the public that wants to offer up any comment on this at this point? Again, we, we will be planning a workshop with, um, you know, public, publicly um, uh, with an opportunity for public participation in that as well. So. Um, uh, but at this time, is there anybody from the public that wants to uh, make a comment or ask a question? I don't see any hands going up. Um, so both Jim and Todd, um, before we move on with any action then from the council, it, so as I said, the, the, the um, you know, intended move here is for us to go to a workshop, have a more thorough discussion, but can, can you maybe circle back to, um, be, before we get to that point, uh, signaling for myself and the rest of the council a little bit more of what you're looking for from us at this point in the process? So the, yeah, so the intent was um, to call to your attention where we are in the process. And I, 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 my feeling is, and I think the feeling of the committee and, and uh, Richardson and Associates is, that we are very tight on a final version of this. We didn't wanna to go to final version until after we get feedback from a workshop. So what we like to do is get as close to that as we can. Obviously we've got a limited budget and we're running out of time and things got slowed down you know, due to this past year. So we just wanna be efficient, as efficient as possible in getting feedback on the overall concepts and the process that we used and the public participation and make sure that nothing in here um, is completely out of alignment with the expectations of the council. Um, so we're thinking that a, a workshop would resolve that. We could then wrap up the uh, recommendation to the town council, and then you would then take a vote on accepting that. And, and as is the case with, I think, any master plan, this, is, um, this doesn't bind us to any of the recommendations. What it does is gives us a roadmap to work with as we present our recommendations to you for approval. So I, I, I don't think that everything has to be buttoned up super tightly, but we want that recommendation to be very much in line with the thoughts from the, uh, all of the public that participated and certainly from the council that funds the activities within the park. Um, and, 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 I, and I do hope you recognize that a, that a lot of what we just took you through at a very high speed really does focus on the members of the community and, and more of a four season utilization. And that really reflects a lot of work that we've done in the last several years on accommodating our guests from away. And we've we got we to turn back to our residents at this point. Yeah. Um, thank you for both of those last points of emphasis, Jim. I, I think that number one, um, you're exactly right in calling out the fact that, I mean, if you look back to the last update to the master plan for Fort Williams, there are things that were accomplished from that. There are some things that weren't, and there are some things that have been done at the park that weren't in any master plan. So um, it's, it, it serves as, as you said, as a roadmap, but not, um, you know, um, a sort of declaration of, uh, you know, things that are etched in stone in any way. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just going to, uh, uh, you know, compliment 
you and and Todd and the rest of the folks that have all been leading this effort um, for you know what looks to be an extremely um, thorough body of work to this point, and I'm excited to get even further into detail on it. But also uh, thank all those who have been participants in this process, whether as members of the committee or uh, resources and staff, or most importantly, members of the community and other stakeholders um, you know, who have a vested interest in its outcome. So um, I think this is really impressive um, what you guys have put together. I think it'll serve as a good um, you know, uh, you know, source of much deeper and further discussion um, at a workshop and, and then ultimately um, when it moves forward, getting into, you know, prioritizing and action planning and things like that. So um, is there anybody else from the council that wants to offer up any comment at this time? Or if not, I'm happy to accept a motion to refer this to a future workshop. Um, I know also, Jim, be, uh, you, you noted sort of where you are with both time and, and budget resources. Um, uh, so I, I don't know, Matt, if we have a specific workshop based on those parameters that we want to put it to, whether it's this July workshop that, that we just discussed potentially putting together or if, or if this was sort of planned to be already slotted in August or, or what have you. So I'll, I'll look for some guidance from you on that. I was, I was just looking at the, uh, at the August, August calendar as well. Uh, August is fairly wide open. You could totally, you could grab a scheduled workshop during that time period if that would work for uh, for the timetable that works for the committee as well. Um, that you know, we could definitely get one in there. Right now, we do not have one scheduled in August. Uh, I don't believe either after looking at that. So we could we could. Jim or, Jim or Todd, do you have a, a sense based on what? I mean, obviously, you can't anticipate the, the discussion and input that we're going to provide to you at that workshop. But do you have a sense of after that, like how much work is left to sort of button up and, and put a bow on this? Or I, I think we've got the bow in our hand. We're ready to do that. Okay. We just wanted to make sure there wasn't there were no items on here that were showstoppers, appalling, met with significant resistance. Yeah. So we're we're ready to go when you are. Okay. Um, so maybe an August workshop with bringing it back for discussion and, and public comment, further public comment opportunities in September and, and sort of rolling through that schedule. Because um, that then takes us into the beginning of budget planning season for fiscal 23, which I know many of these things will, that are contemplated will need to be factored into. So um, that overall broad timeline feels appropriate and right to me, I, seeing a few head nods around the screen. Yeah. So um, it, if, if that's what others are feeling, so maybe we'll make a motion to refer this to an August workshop. Anybody want to do that? Councilor Boucher? Make a motion to refer this to August workshop. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Deb, could you call the roll for that vote, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Great. Um, Jim and Todd, uh, and oh, go ahead, Jim. So just one quick comment before we wrap up. Yeah. I just special thanks to uh, Kathy Raftis and Chris Cutter from Community Services who really shepherded us through this project. It's been a tremendous amount of work and we're not there yet, but I just want to call them out and certainly Todd and his team. So thank you. Very much appreciate that, Jim, and, and their work as well. So thanks for acknowledging it. Um, thank you both for being part of the meeting here tonight. And for the work to this point, we'll look forward to uh, having more discussion in a couple months on it. Thank you. Look forward to it as well. Thanks. All right. Uh, so that brings us to uh, item 17 in our agenda, which is number 97-2021, recommendation from the ordinance committee relating to town center affordable housing amendments. Um, 
The Ordinance Committee has made a recommendation back to the Council by a vote of three to nothing at their May 19th meeting um, to recommend the Town Center Affordable Housing Amendments, which are included in our packet here tonight. Um, so our potential actions on this this evening are to accept that recommendation um, uh, and uh, move it to a public hearing or refer this back to further workshop discussion amongst the full council or ordinance committee meeting, which I'll note that the last ordinance committee uh, or a previous ordinance committee uh, meeting on this involved the full council, which was much appreciated um, by myself. So um, before we get to public comment on this, which I expect we're going to have a fair amount of based on the number of attendees left and uh, nobody has commented on any of the other items preceding this. Um, either Penny or um, I think I saw Town Planner is included in the gallery. Yes. Um, maybe it would be helpful just um, for a quick overview before we open it up to public comment. Now, uh, if, if neither of you have anything to say, Maureen or Penny, there were a few things that I wanted to say just to sort of do some table setting. but. Um, maybe uh, either of you um, with any comments specific to the recommendation. Oops. Jamie, I don't have anything specific relative to um, um, the recommendations beyond saying that our um, our our conversation um, at the ordinance committee. Um, as a group was that it was really something that needed to go to the full council for um, more, um, I would say, discussion. I don't know. What do you, uh, that's, that's was my takeaway. Maureen, do you have, or Caitlin, do you have a, or Jeremy, do you have a different take on it? No, that's basically what my thought was that we needed to move it here to either have talk here or have it go to a workshop and talk about it. Great. I see Jeremy nodding. Okay, um, I'll open it up for public comment in a minute. Um, Maureen, was there anything that you wanted to add or not? No? Okay. Um, so uh, the council has received a, substan a substantial amount of input from uh, the community uh, relating to this item. Um, I'd say I haven't counted them all up, but I don't know, folks, would you say we've had at least 40 or so emails from people, if not more, um, on this? Um, so uh, certainly more, more volume of communication than usual. Um, what I want to do just in terms of a, a, a sort of resetting of the item, though, uh, before we move forward to some public comment here, is just um, remind people briefly where we are at in this process, because a, a lot of the communication to us um, has been, uh, at least how I've read it and interpreted it, um, people thinking that somehow even this evening we are voting on approving a project or approving a development or you know uh, anything like that, which is just simply um, not what's happening in the order of the process and the order of operations. And um, certainly in conversations that I've had with people on this topic, um, you know, it's been expressed to me that, well, it, it you know, if, if it gets past the council at a certain point, then it's a done deal and it doesn't really matter, which, um, you know, I, I disagree with that. And I think that that dramatically discounts the work of the planning board and the very thorough um, planning review process that they endeavor on a project like this or anything else in town. So, um, but what we are doing here tonight is just raising um, further discussion on recommendations back from the ordinance committee around potential changes to amendments that would allow for the type of development of which there is a very real example with a proposal from um, the Zanton company and uh, their Dunham Court proposal. So, um, but we're not approving that tonight. We're not uh, giving that the green light. Um, what we would be doing is just further discussing and then eventually having a full public hearing um, uh, on um, the amendments that would allow for the type of development that's been proposed. Um, so just to clarify that for folks, because I think there's just been a lot of um, 
concern about the speed at which this is moving and 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 how things you know may or may not be adhering to process or, or things like that and um, what the council had done was tasked the planning board with um, coming back to us with a recommendation that said if we were to revise these ordinances um, to accommodate this kind of development that's been uh, uh, proposed here what would those revisions look like and then the uh, planning board did that work and came back to us and then the ordinance committee took those recommendations that came from the planning board and had further discussion and uh, you know contemplated those further and then that's what's being brought back here to the council tonight from so from here uh, like I said we would you know plan to eventually schedule a public hearing on this item um, there may be subsequent workshops uh, that take place between now and, and any public hearing or after a public hearing um, before we would even get to the point of whether or not to approve or not the amendments um, that are being proposed. And even after all that has been said, there is then the very, you know, detailed and lengthy process, which I alluded to, which would be a project actually moving forward to the planning application phase and site plan review and all of the thorough studies that accompany that, whether it be uh, traffic impact, uh, you know, you know, parking needs, all of those kinds of stuff, all the things that go into uh, the very detailed um, uh, process of site plan and, and a project like this. So anyway, that's sort of a, a long winded way of saying that there's a lot of road still ahead of us um, on this hypothetical, uh, not so hypothetical, you know, um, thing that we're talking about here. Um, but tonight is an opportunity for folks to weigh in further on it. Um, and so uh, if anybody from the public wants to do that, I'm gonna open up the, the opportunity to do that now. So if you could please raise your hand using the um, raise hand feature in Zoom, um, we'll call on you. If you could give us your name and address and uh, limit your comments to about three minutes if you could. Um, again, with the understanding that there's going to be continued future opportunity for discussion on this um, and a full public hearing as well. Um, the time limit for public comment um, on a regular agenda item like this is generally 15 minutes. Um, we'll leave it to the council to decide based on the number of people that are looking to speak whether or not we go beyond that this evening. So the first person in the queue, um, and I uh, see your mic's already open, is Sarah Lennon. So go ahead, Sarah, and if you could just give us your name, uh, your address uh, as well, please. Hi, I'm Sarah Lennon. I live at uh, 54 Cranbrook Drive. I appreciate uh, your, your, your taking the time tonight to hear from us and from going through this very long process. Um, I just had two super quick things to say. The first is uh, uh, when I was on the council and there was any contentious issue, uh, Jamie, we used to count the number of emails that had come in and we would also report how many were um, in favor and how many were opposed. And I, I thought that was really helpful for the for the public just as a matter of transparency um, because, and I think it should be the emails from to both the council and the planning board because on May 4th, which was six weeks ago, I received the ones that had come in and there were 74. So when you say there have been about 40, that feels confusing to me unless you mean just from the last meeting. I think it's would be very helpful information to say how many have we received since we started this project how many were opposed and how many before we did that for the traffic light and several other things that's just an aside that's not what i meant to say but i just think that and real quickly sarah I, I won't i won't i won't keep counting your time so you'll get your time back going i i am referring to just literally since okay. the last oh, okay 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 yeah. yeah i think overall also is important because it just shows the level of engagement um and the only other thing that i wanted to say which the counselors already i hope know because i emailed you a couple of days ago um I, you know, this project keeps moving forward because what's cited as the motivation is a substantial public benefit. Um, and so, and, and I don't feel like that's really been discussed. So I hope tonight in your discussions, you will all touch on that. I, and I think I would love to hear and probably others would love to hear, like what's your definition of a substantial public benefit and how do you feel that this that this project and this proposal meets that rather high standard um, 
of a justification. I mean, that's a pretty sizable thing to say that it's substantial public benefit. That implies that this is going to benefit a large number of Cape Elizabeth citizens. And I just wanna know how each of you think it will. I mean, just from your heart uh, or your head or how you've been thinking about this. So thank you, that's all I have to say. I look forward to listening to you on that. Thank you for your comment, Sarah. Um, next up, I see the hand of Kurt Kelly raised. So uh, Kurt, yes. you could just give us your name and address, please. Yes, Kurt Kelly, 374 Mitchell Road uh, in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering about uh, the program is, is now being called the Affordable Housing uh, Amendment. And is this Section 8, uh, HUD, is it, it, their definition of affordable housing? Is this something we made up? Um, most affordable housing is uh, with some type of pathway to ownership. Uh, and so I'm wondering, how, did, how are we using affordable housing? Is it Section 8 HUD uh, uh, property? Um. I'll make sure that we circle back to answer your question, Mr. Kelly, in, in our discussion. Um, did you have any further comment or? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yep. Um, are there other folks that would like to speak? I don't see any hands currently raised. Okay. Going once, going twice. All right, we'll move on from public comment then. Um, either, um, so, uh, in regards to Mr. Kelly's question, I, I'm, I want to answer it in two different ways. Number one is that the um, proposed Dunham Court um, development um, does is is not of the type of housing that you uh, were asking about, Mr. Kelly. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to either the planner or uh, anybody from the ordinance committee to maybe clarify or parse um, the language in the ordinance amendments. Um, again, because we've, we've been trying to look at this in, through two lenses, right? There's um, the amendments as they would be proposed for an affordable housing project. And then obviously there is the real life example of such a project that's been brought forward for consideration, potential consideration um, on the other side of these amendments. So uh, I don't know, Maureen or anybody from the Ordinance Committee, if you would like to speak to the, the relevance of the different types of affordable housing um, and different programs and whether or not some of those things would or would not, not fit under the um, proposed amendments. Go ahead, Maureen. So the amendments in front of you, they're called the Town Center Affordable Housing Amendments because we need a name when the, these amendments are floating around the community and when um, the Ordinance Committee and the Planning Board and the Council are talking about them. It's just easier to give them a name. The name is just supposed to be a way to start the discussion. So we call them the Town Center Affordable Housing Amendments. The amendments are absolutely neutral as to what the funding source is for creating the affordable housing. So it, it's not tied to any one specific type of funding source. In theory, someone who has no subsidy at all, I guess, out of the goodness of their heart could use these amendments uh, to build a project. So the amendments create um, some unique provisions that only are only projects that meet high standards of creating affordable housing are eligible to take advantage of. And I can go into more detail into the text, but that's the way I would answer the question. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As well as uh, Section 8 housing itself is a program that's run by Maine Housing 
and it's determined by income eligibility and it's not specific to a project but it's actually uh it's tied to the person the individual based on their income and then they can uh they can provide they can use that voucher it's 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 travelable, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, where it could be with any type of private rental housing that meets certain housing quality inspection standards. And if the owner accepts that person as a tenant. So uh, it's not specific to a project, but specific to a tenant. So uh, that uh, I hope that helps uh, more clearly define uh, the Section 8 requirements, or at least the Section 8 qualification. Um. Matt, can you open up Mr. Kelly's microphone again? Because he's got his hand raised and I just want to make sure that that answered his question and he didn't come close to using the three minutes of his time. So if there's a follow-up, I'll be happy to hear it. So yes, sir. go ahead, Mr. Kelly. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And thanks for that clarification. I just wonder how it became the town center, uh, that the town center wound up in this affordable housing uh, discussion because we do have a town center plan and I don't know, has that been uh, dis discarded? Uh, the, the plan was really intended to promote pedestrian and vehicle safety, create a gathering place, uh, encourage small business, enhance the town identity, and accomplish these goals with moderate financial impact. And it contradicts every one of those points. And it, it's, it's, it, it it's not about the issue of affordable housing. I think there's a need for that. It's the town center. It's the town green where you're gonna, you're, it, it will look, the renderings show three high-end luxury vehicles in there and there'll be almost a hundred cars parked there. Uh, it, there's, it, it appears the planning board, it, it, to quote them, commercial development is dead in Cape Elizabeth. And so giving away commercial space, um, it's not a gathering place anymore for town residents. And I think uh, the question, which the, the big issue is how does this benefit our community? Uh, and certainly uh, Freeport has a great program for affordable housing, which is a pathway to ownership. And I'm sure, uh, and I think there was discussion about before anything is done on this, there would be uh, some type of consultation with experts on the best way to provide the best affordable housing pro program for CAPE. But I'm just wondering how we're tying in the town center with this affordable housing. Uh, it, it's just kind of all got slurred together now. Um, it was a Zanson project, now it's a Dun Dunham. Uh, I, I'm very confused about this process. And thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for your comments, Mr. Kelly. Um, so, uh, maybe I or if any other counselors want to weigh in on this too, by all means, uh, uh, again, I'll, I'll go back to sort of table setting to pro hopefully provide some clarity. Um, so um, over a two year process, um, a wide ranging group of citizens uh, were part of the comprehensive plan committee um, that produced in 2019, uh, the latest update to our comprehensive plan. And within that comprehensive plan, there was uh, you know, a, a large focus on housing generally, and in some cases, um, uh, uh, both affordability of housing uh, and how that's becoming more of a challenging issue for a number of different demographics, um, both currently within the community or for, for people looking to enter the community, um, as well as um, a, a, a lack of variability of housing type. Um, and that both of those were um, points of concern um, for the town going forward and things that would likely need to be addressed through the um, revision of existing ordinances or the adoption of new ordinances um, that would allow for potentially different um, housing types to be created or uh, different uh, funding mechanisms to promote certain types of housing or um, the ability to create housing on smaller lot sizes, uh, a, a whole variety of different um, potential solutions um, 
not any one that that would be considered sort of the singular or or sort of silver bullet to address what's obviously a complex and um, you know extremely layered um, challenge facing not just Cape Elizabeth but you know the region as a whole. Um, so Mr. Kelly alluded to the town center plan, which um, I don't remember uh, off the top of my head the exact date that that was implemented, and there were, have been some tweaks to that. Maybe either Maureen or any of the other councilors or Matt can can remind me of the date of that. But it's going 14, 2014 was the most recent update, and the and the um, original work on that goes back even further than that. Um, and so as we've discussed it at some previous meetings, there is some inherent tension and admitted contradiction between some things that were previously laid out in town center plan uh, and some of the things that surfaced in the update to the comprehensive plan. And uh, you know, those things certainly have yet to be reconciled um, uh, you know, in a specific way. Um, so fast forward to the completion of the town center plan. And uh, that was like, I, uh, I'm sorry, the comprehensive plan. And like I said, that was, um, you know, work that was 2019 and presented uh, to the council in early um, uh, uh, 2020, I think uh, when it was finalized and we, we put our action planning to, you know, what were the priority steps and things like that. So coming out of the comprehensive plan, there's a whole series of recommendations. They number more than, I think, almost 100 in, in number. And the council broke down, you know, what are the things that we're going to assign work to and assign action plans. And the usual process with a comprehensive plan is that you're taking those action items. And in the cases where they involve revisions to ordinances or changes or introduction of new ordinances, you would undertake that work at the ordinance committee level with you know, assistance of the planner and the planning board and, and of any other necessary resources. And in between assigning, uh, gathering up all those action items, we got relatively sidetracked with a, a few other substantial items last year, uh, most notably being all the work that was being done in response to the pandemic and um, some of the budget issues associated uh, with that in, in the springtime. And then uh, significantly, the town council spent a, a, a great deal of time uh, working on items like the short term rental ordinance revisions and things like that. So what we didn't have was that work that I just described that would normally take place uh, on some of those priority recommendations and priority items. In the intervening time, the Zanton company has come forward with a proposal that said, hey, in your comprehensive plan, you've identified that you have um, you know, a, a need and a focus on increasing the availability of affordable housing, making more variability of housing type uh, available to folks. And we have this proposal that we'd like to put forward in order to make it work. What the development company says, we need these changes to your existing ordinances to make this a viable project. So that's how we've gotten to the point of considering recommendations to revise ordinances that have been done at the request of a developer who has a project that they'd like to put forward, but is, you know, from my perspective, um, while, you know, somewhat out of sequence, not out of sync with um, uh, things that were brought forward as part of our comprehensive planning process uh, that went over two years. So that's the sort of how we are where we are with this today. Um, and I, I welcome any other comments from counselors that uh, either uh, add to that or um, provide a different perspective or anything like that. But go ahead, uh, Penny, your hands raised. Yeah, another item that was in the uh, comprehensive plan that had to do with developing strategies to start to promote small businesses in the, in the town center. And I think uh, my peers here on the council have heard this many times you don't uh, uh, businesses don't bring people people bring businesses and until you can have businesses in the center of town uh, until you have people in the center of town you're not going to build significant uh, business 
The other thing is uh, aging in place in our community. That was another priority from a comprehensive planning perspective, um, allowing uh, or identifying ways for, uh, uh, for people to be able to age in place. Um, the other was, um, uh, there was has been a lot of, uh, or there had been a lot of discussion around um, uh, uh, public transportation. Again, uh, in order for public transportation to be viable in Cape Elizabeth, there needs to be um, uh, uh, people who are going to be using that transportation. So uh, if you go through the comprehensive plan and you kind of look at uh, what some strategies might be. Um, um, basically, when you look at developing some sort of housing uh, in the town center, it can help build toward um, achieving some of those strategies. Am I saying it's the perfect solution? No. I'm just, and I think this has brought a, a lot of conversation to the table, but I will end that there and let other people speak because I have a bunch of other stuff I'd like to say at some point. Thanks, Penny. Um, does anybody else have anything specific they wanna say at this point or? Go ahead, Councilor Noonan. Thanks. Um, I don't. I I'll limit what I say since I don't think we had a motion yet. We're still responding. I, I think yep. right. To, um, I just wanted to respond to something that Sarah said um, about the number of emails. I had um, someone else ask me that, so I did a really quick and informal count. So please don't take this as gospel. But uh, I just went through all the emails we've gotten, um, and I counted about fifty-five. This is a few days ago. Separate people who had emailed us. Um, who were in disagreement with this. So, and then I saw, I've seen another like five or so names just this morning that I didn't really recognize. So I'm estimating we've heard from about 60 individuals. And I would, yeah, thank you, Gretchen. And co contextually, uh, it, it, I think you can count on less than one hand, those that are in support of the um, proposal. So, um, I welcome other folks' comments on this um, at this point. Like Gretchen just said, we don't have a motion on the table. I would like to make a motion or, or entertain a motion rather, um, if others are agreeable to it, um, to uh, have the council take this up at a, at a workshop uh, in discussion and in, in particular um, invite um, uh, public participation in that workshop um, so that it's it's more of a question and answer um, and information setting kind of meeting. Um, one of the things that I've noticed uh, consistently um, in some of the communication that we've been getting are things that are either um, uh, just factually incorrect um, or folks that have significant questions about the nature of TIF financing. Uh, which I think many of us and members of the community would all benefit from um, having a, a more thorough understanding of, um, as well as, um, you know, things as simple as, you know, I've received emails that have said, oh, I see foundation being poured. This is happening before it's even been approved, not even realizing that there's four sites on this lot and that one already approved project that has nothing to do with the proposed affordable housing is the one that's underway and, and, and not the, the one that's um, the, the source of so much um, input and debate. So um, what, I, what I'd like to do, and, and I think that it's possible um, that uh, for when we would do this, uh, that the, the town hall might be reopened to the public for, um, both in-person public participation, and I don't know if we can continue at that point with um, sort of a hybrid Zoom participation as well, but I think that um, 
what I'm sensing is that there's just a, a significant information um, gap or, or, or void that's growing. Um, and and in, in that growing gap are um, sort of people taking firmer and firmer positions that maybe um, aren't, aren't uh, you know, sort of grounded in uh, the actual facts before us. So um, that's kind of what I'd like to see happen as a next step. And I don't know what other folks' thoughts are on that. So, Councilor Jordan. Uh, yes, that's uh, that's kind of in line with uh, where I was thinking. I was I was taking it from the uh, public hearing perspective, but I think a a uh, roll up your sleeves uh, workshop with um, significant uh, participation from people who are attending is exactly something like that. Is exactly what needs to happen. I think in order to prepare for that, I think we need to somebody needs to go through the emails and identify those questions because the, the the questions that need to be answered because those emails have common thread uh, and I think we need to need to pull those out I think somehow and it's it's very difficult because it's the project that precipitated the uh, uh, the proposals around ordinance changes so it's very difficult uh, for people uh, uh, to separate the two things. Uh, so somehow through the uh, this workshop, uh, we need to uh, somehow demonstrate how the ordinance changes benefit the town center and Cape Elizabeth's vision uh, absent of a project. We got to separate them, even though uh, at the same time, at the same meeting, we have to answer questions about the project. Um, I think there was one email that we received and I wish I had had, um, I meant to read it again before this meeting who actually alluded to the fact that some of those changes make sense for the town center, but they aren't supportive of the project. Uh, I thought that was a great, a, a great email. Um, so I think to really pull together this uh, uh, workshop, there's there's a, a lot of pre-work that needs to go into it. We need to know the questions that we are going to answer or that need to be answered. Um, we need to, I also think um, uh, for this meeting somehow have, um, um, more information about what are the trends going on in our state and across the country to diversify housing in order to make it, and affordable is no longer the term, um, and I wish I could remember off the top of my head what it is, but I, I really, you told me. yeah, I really think we need to pull in um, some of the work that's been done uh, by the main municipal association um, and uh, the experts kind of they have called in to do some webinars because there's some really good information out there that we all need to learn that says here's what communities across Maine and across the country are doing to diversify their housing stock in order that people can get into either, if they want to be renters, they get into uh, rental apartments. If they want to be in houses, I, I love the fact that, um, I can't remember his name, um, brought up the fact that there are models of uh, people being able to um, um, rent to buy, those kind of things can happen. I think that all of that needs to be rolled into this. It's really um, uh, a, a process of, of education and understanding on not just our part, but uh, the whole community. And so that's what I would propose. And that's a pretty intense workshop that, I think needs to be facilitated in a way that we really get to the meat of the 
uh, questions and have a really extensive dialogue around this. That would be my proposal. Councilor Boucher. Um, Penny got to it, so I don't want to echo too hard, but I was just picturing like, we need some sort of central repository for people to be able to visit like a website page or something about what's the problem statement? Why is affordable housing a crisis right now? Why, why do we care in Cape Elizabeth? Why do we find this to be something that we need to be combating and trying to find solutions for? And I think that there's research that we have probably received in our inboxes from the comprehensive plan on that the public hasn't seen. And I think that we need to make that accessible to them. And we need to have probably a workshop before the workshop that you know Penny just described that goes through who are the experts that we need to pull in here. I really struggle with the idea of these ordinances because um, it's one solution that we don't know is the solution for our town right now when there are so many other models that need to be explored. Um, I, I think that having a rent to own program would sound amazing and TIF funds could go to that. And, you know, there's so many different avenues and options. And I think that we need to have some experts pulled in in a workshop before we even get to answering public questions, because they're going to ask about these ordinance changes. And I want to be armed with, you know, yes, we know that one of the challenges for affordable housing developments is ordinances, but maybe it's ordinances outside of our town center too. Maybe there's ordinances that need to change in the rest of the town. And so I just feel uncomfortable with these ordinances right now because it feels um, very narrow and not necessarily getting to the why of the problem and the why in our community and the how. Thanks, Council Boucher. I, I would say yes and for all of that, right? So I think one of the things that's frustrated me about the way that this conversation uh, sort of has, has permeated throughout town has sort of this false binary choice about um, either you're for this specific development and the associated amendments that would be required to move it forward, or you're for all these other things that might be supposed alternatives. And my opinion personally is that it's an all of the above solution that's probably required here. And frankly, was what was highlighted and called out within the comprehensive plan. I think you're spot on to the fact that most people probably are not, you know, familiar with, you know, the very strong body of work that was produced by that group, and um, the associated uh, action items that would, in a number of different ways, in a number of different other areas of town, potentially contribute to addressing this same problem. And the problem statement that you just referred to, I think, is is pretty much captured within that document as well. So if it's a, just a matter of communicating that more clearly and making that information more accessible, then that's on us and staff to figure out how to do that. But I don't think that's a, a situation where we have to go and source that work. That work's already been done. I think it's just a matter of curating it in a way that is, uh, you know, more accessible to folks. But um, what what I what I really want to emphasize is that I think there's a need and I've had, you know, I spoke about this, you know, this morning when meeting with people and have talked about it with others as well, that there's a need for multiple puzzle pieces to be pulled together here. Uh, you know, in, in my opinion, the, you know, the, the development that's been put on the table is, is, I think, a decent one to include in that mix of proposals. But holistically speaking, I think there's a, a lot of other things that probably um, you know, need to take place in order to address different parts of the same problem. I agree. Go ahead, Councilor Devereaux. Um, I, I agree with Councilor Boucher. I think that um, we really need some experts to weigh in at, on these amendments. I think that Penny was talking about that it's difficult for people to separate the ordinance changes from the project. Well, I'm sure it's difficult to separate it because all the amendments are exactly the changes that the developer requested per his specifications. So it looks like we're spot zoning. And I think that if we get experts in to talk about 
density, height, footprint, what, what does that look like on a certain size lot? People that aren't connected to the developer have no financial interest in this, who can talk to us about that because we are talking about making changes so that we can create um, affordable housing or other options downtown. Maybe it's not um, an apartment complex, maybe it is. But we don't know that until we have some experts weigh in and tell us who are we um, as town councilors to say, oh, this is the density specification that's going to work on this lot. I think an expert needs to be consulting with us and talking to us before we make those ordinance changes. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people here in town are familiar with the work done by the comp plan committee. A lot of people were involved in it. I think that a lot of people understand what's going on. And I've seen a lot of emails from people who know what's going on and understand it and are still against the project. So I wouldn't paint it as once we create a website and we tell them they'll all be for it. Uh, I think that there's a lot of very um, responsible, intelligent people in our community um, who have different opinions about this. So it seems to me that we really need a workshop with experts to come in to talk about it. So we have ideas about what we want those ordinance changes to look like first um, before we even take it to the public and have talks. So that's where I suggest we go first. Thanks, Valerie. Um, just super quick response to one of your points. I, I, I think um, I, I think there's still probably a, a, a connection gap between people who who are really familiar with the comp plan, and I think more importantly, you know, based on the some of the questions we're getting of well, what's driving this? Where is this coming from? Well, that, I mean, that is where primarily it's coming from, um, and so for for people to be sort of asking that, I think demonstrates that disconnect um, between that definition of the forward-looking issue that needs to be addressed. So I, I'm not saying aggregating all of that information in a single place on a web page or something is going to change their minds or, or solve for that, but it, it at the very least, it should answer for people the question, why is this even something that you're, you're thinking about? Well, that's exactly why, because it's what we as a council adopted as part of the update to the comprehensive plan. So, um, Councilor Noonan. So I, I agree with a lot of what Valerie just said. Um, I feel like one of the missing pieces here has been just a really frank discussion about whether each of these is appropriate for our town center. Um, somehow I feel like that hasn't happened I don't know, Val, Valerie, if it needs to be experts or if we just need to come together and figure out what sort of research we need done. Um, Penny had referred to an email that we got this morning. I think I know which one she's talking about. And I had um, also found it really well thought out. And that person had talked a little bit about, you know, that our anecdotally, we know that, um, you know, we have some struggles with commercial space in town, but it would be really nice to have the data to back that up before we make such a big decision. So to talk about, you know, what is the turnover look like in the center of town? You know, how many open lots do we have in town? You know, what kind of increase in population can we expect that would support more commercial businesses? Just putting our heads together and figuring out what sort of background information, whether it is an expert or just data that we've dug up that can support that, the, that these amendments are appropriate for our town center and what we want in our town center. So I'm I'm agreeing with the need for a workshop and just think that that for me has been the, the big gap. Other comments or a motion? I'll make a motion that we move this to a workshop. Second. Um, first and a second, is there discussion uh, on the motion? 
I'd like to have this be a standalone workshop and not combined with the other item that we just referred to our July workshop. And I'd like to do this sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I just want to make sure the council is on board with signing up for more work sooner rather than later. So seeing head nods and everything. So we'll do all our scheduling um, uh, shortly here, but um, I think we're looking at, at uh, multiple meetings potentially in, in somewhat um, quick succession to another one another for each of those different topics. So <clears throat> other discussion on going to a workshop, Valerie? I would just like to point out that um, a lot of people take vacations in July, especially around 4th of July, when we're talking about um, possibly doing a, a workshop. I'd like to do a workshop on this when, um, when we're going to have a lot of people that can attend rather than people that are on vacation. So um, I'd like to do it conceivably next week. So that's what I was thinking of. But um, we can get, like I said, we can get to specific scheduling minute, but I agree. Next week sounds good while it's fresh in our minds. <coughs> and we may find that it might not be the only one we figure out that we need to have on it. I think somebody else, I forget who just made that point a minute ago, but um, so, but at the very least, the, the, the main thing I'm most interested in doing in accomplishing in the next step, because we, we might not be able to get um, you know, some of the other things that have been brought up here on the table. But the, the main thing I want to do is just have the opportunity to get more um, engagement from community and, and answer questions and get information out on the table so that people are working from um, the same set of facts. You know, like things like I said, you know, what what is specifically involved with TIF financing or even the question that Mr. Kelly asked earlier tonight about the type of housing that we're talking about here. I like, I, I think that there's some very basic things when people hear the broad idea of this project and the amendments that would need to go with it in order to make it happen that, um, you know, there, there's probably not uh, as um, necessary understanding, you know, common understanding of, of some of the things that are actually being um, proposed and, and considered. So, if there's if there's subsequent meeting that happens because we want to bring in a Jeff Levine um, who had presented to the planning board previously uh, with information that I think was great and probably because that was so early in this process something that you know a lot of people have missed I've I've referenced that in conversations with people and they had no idea that that was even out there or had happened or anything like that so you know maybe it's a matter of bringing him back maybe it's other resources from GP Cog MMA is something that was talked about like these are all things that may have to happen maybe not as something we schedule for next week, but, you know, as a follow-up or follow-on to that. But at, at a bare minimum, my hope and expectation is that we'd be able to um, engage in a more frank discussion and answer questions in a way that hopefully um, clarifies things for folks. Um, and like I said, you know, may not change minds of the public or frankly, you know, any of the rest of the six of you, um, but at least gets a common set of facts out on the table. So um, what, um, what date might work for next week? Let's, let's tackle this one first and then we'll get to the, um, get back to the library thing in a minute, but. Oh, oh. Tuesdays are planning board, right, Maureen? You're on mute, Maureen. Yeah, the 22nd is the fourth Tuesday, so it's not planning board. That's available. Uh, oh, the okay. 21st is also, Mr. Chairman, a week from tonight. Is that I can. Calendar? Does anybody have a conflict for the 22nd, Tuesday, the 22nd? Oh. Is Monday better, Jeremy? Um, no, well, not really. I, 
Thursday would be best for me next week. I'm, I'm chasing tides, but um, I could I could probably make Monday or Tuesday work if need be. If it helps, I know he's available Wednesday night. I, I have a conflict Wednesday night. I have CPR training at the fire department. Tuesday sounded generally okay, or? Okay, so uh, motion to refer to workshop. We're gonna add to that for it to be Tuesday the 22nd, uh, seven o'clock. Um, any other discussion? Go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, you had mentioned having, I don't know if it was intended to be this meeting or one of the other ones, um, having this in person. Um, is that your intention for Tuesday? Um, I don't know, Matt, what's, what, what's possibility on that? Well, I, I think the governor is, re, uh, sorry, lowering her restrictions effective as of June 30th. Mm -hmm. So I think you're looking at probably uh, through the month of June, at least uh, Zoom, Zoom meetings. In-person effect impacts my availability next week. I won't, I won't be back from MDI until 8 p.m. at the earliest. Go ahead, Nicole. We talked about pulling together research and my concern about doing something on Tuesday is are we going to have staff resources to pull together those old meetings you were talking about and things that we should probably watch before we answer public questions, if that's the intent of the workshop. So I'm just concerned that's, you know, giving staff maybe four days to get it done. Um, the week school ends, it, it's a rough, I, I'm not sure that that's doable. And for us to review it in enough time. Go ahead, Valerie. I, I have to agree. Uh, and I'd really like to do it in person where we have um, an in-person meeting so that people um, can really feel like they're heard and seen. I'm, looking, I'm scrolling through the calendar. I'm, that's why I'm pausing. If, if it would be helpful, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, some some of the information that we do have that the council has seen uh, in the past, uh, you know, such as Jeff Levine's report, uh, and there's another report that I've uh, was also performed by a Frank O'Hara for GP Cog uh, that talk that discusses housing, and I know uh, we could, I think we could most likely pull together the information relating to the comprehensive plan and the recommendations from there, as Maureen's uh, uh, intimately. Uh, uh, knowledgeable of the of the comp plan, if we wanted to pull forward uh, that that information there, um, as far as looking at some of the elements that are uh, the common elements for questions from from all the emails that have been submitted, uh, I think we could probably pull a lot of those common elements together in, in time for your review uh, to get that and try to to codify that or at least get them identified into groupings in advance uh, for that. Um, I'm looking at other notes that I had here as well. Just trying to think of different areas that, or items that we could pull forward. The TIF question, uh, I could be prepared to speak on that as far as how, how the math looks on that uh, as well and uh, some projections that would be able to be applied uh, and the process that we would have to uh, have to undertake or the council would have to undertake, sorry, to do that. So we can, we can pull that information forward as well. Uh, and if there are other areas that you'd like us to focus on, we, we could pull a lot of that together. I think Council Boucher has a a great point because it is the last, you know, tomorrow's the last day of school, uh, and there is the launch of uh, of summer for for many. Uh, that may be a challenge for others. Uh, then you start walking into the following week, uh, you know, the Fourth of July week, it, and it's kind of a straddler because the following week as well is uh, 
is part of the 4th of July week because the 5th is a holiday. Uh, so um, just uh, just trying to help work through, but let you know the elements that we can probably pull together in fairly short order if that would be helpful to the council. What was what was everybody's availability for Thursday? Was Thursday an option or not? I can't do Thursday. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I kind of I, I I was leaning more towards where you were, Matt. Where I I think there's more of this already pulled together than. Right. In diff just in different places than people might realize. Um, and certainly just even from all of our own readings of the emails, I think we've seen, you know, four or five main points get hit, in, hit on in a lot of them. And so, you know, uh, uh, in a workshop setting, if we were to just be simply sort of addressing, you know, you know here are some of the most frequent questions um, or, or concerns that people have put forward on this. And if there is a response, uh, in, in any direction on it, then, you know, that's the opportunity to, to sort of answer it in that kind of form, I guess. But, um, you know, I say that I'm, I'm not the one that has to do the work <laughs> to get it pulled together. So um, I, I guess it, it's really you, Matt and Maureen that have to make the determination on whether or not you think that that's something that's doable or not. But. I was paying attention to Maureen's head movements and found that I was not completely sawing through the branch that I was going out onto. Uh, most of them were positive. So uh, I think she could pull a lot of that together as well. Go ahead, Valerie. Um, what, can we be creative where we have this meeting? Can we do it at the school in the auditorium? Um, it's a big space, they'll be out of, there won't be any classes. It would, um, I think, be something that would work if it's not in, a, in town. What do you think, Matt? One, one thought that comes to mind is this might be a good, good start. And then you, as the council has identified, you, you, it sounds like you'd like to have an additional, additional workshop after this as well. Um, this could be a good uh, kind of a precursor to the next next one as well. Uh, so you could have the first, you know, first one. And generally, you know, you, we've done really well on the numbers with people coming to Zoom meetings as far as uh, access with people being able to do that. Uh, if you had a hot night, you might not get as many uh, who people may tend to stay home. And just a thought. Uh, the thing that's just hardest with this, I, I agree with you about accessibility. I think the thing that's just so hard is that is the natural dialogue back and forth, and that's that's what I'm really struggling with. And and you know, I'm reminded of the very good discussions that we had in town hall with you know a, a much smaller group, I imagine, of interested parties. But um, you know, some of the conversations we had around short-term rentals um, and bringing those stakeholders together, and there was just a, a lot it was a lot easier to facilitate the back and forth than I think is doable through this setting. So um, that's that's my only concern. So I, I guess I, I'm kind of not clear on what the limitation is on the gatherings because I, uh, and you know, if it's something that, if it was indoors at an alternative venue or something like that, and people had to be masked or something like that, I, I mean, I don't think, folks would, that would dissuade folks from participating. Um, but I'm also, I'm not real clear I, I, on, I know the state of emergency ends June 30th, but um, other other modifications have already been made to gathering limits already. So can you clarify that Matt or? Well, Specifically, what uh, we haven't really received much more guidance as far as municipal buildings. They've they've kept the physical distancing and the uh, and and those types of items have always stayed uh, the same all along, um, even with the most recent release. If she if it would be more clear, I mean, we're looking at still having the physical distancing within the within the building, uh, and it's not the largest space that you have as far as the council chambers. If you did want to go, and we could look into using something like the auditorium, you know, or the uh, or the gymnasium that could, you know, we'd have to reach out to the school to get something along those lines. I don't know if you'd get the same results there uh, as well. Um, 
just just as a thought that's all there's been kind of our, our biggest challenge all along I agree with Jamie, the dialogue needs to be face to face. Sorry, I spilled the coffee on my computer. Um, anyway, um, and I don't see why we can't use a gymnasium or, an, or the auditorium. And I understand that uh, Jeremy's going to need to kind of zoom in anyway, but we can set him at the table. Um, so I I think it's just something we, we've got to focus on getting done. Um, and um, if we can make it happen next week, it's also the materials from the MMA uh, middle class housing thing that is just so fabulous. Um, and we can't get in because we don't have credentials to get into it. But if you could get those credentials to us, I think that's a really worthwhile um, worthwhile video for everybody to watch before we have uh, our meeting. Um, but anyway, I say face-to-face -face meeting. I'd like to shoot for next week. I think we've got most of the materials um, relative to TIFF. I think it's more than seeing numbers. Somebody has to give us TIFFs for dummy. Uh, TIFFs 101. TIFF something, I, I can read numbers and see how they're gonna play out, but explain to me, uh, and I've heard it explained uh, several times, but put it in writing, uh, take me through it as if I were a sixth grader, and, um, and then everybody should understand TIFFs and then we can respond to people's um, uh, concerns. So anyway, I say face to face. Matt, I'm, all, I'm also just looking at the governor's website and I, I'm just, I'm confused how to reconcile. The, the directive seems pretty clear as of May 25th that all capacity limits for indoor gatherings and outdoor gatherings are lifted. So I'm not, I'm not sure why that would still be a barrier for us, but. I know, I know the state of emergency doesn't expire till the end of the month, right. and I understood that that was for you know, sort of basically transition purposes, but. But, you know, if, if you want to go next week on the 22nd in the council chambers, Mr. Chairman, we can make it happen. We'll open the windows and we'll do whatever you want to do. Um, well, I think, that's what we follow I think there might even be some merit to a larger venue if we think there's going to be a large audience, but. Yeah, yeah, and the the other, I mean, the other thought is possibly the library at the high school has uh, larger capacity as well. Um, but I'd have no, to. I don't no, want to. No, that lighting is terrible. Oh, okay, it's one of the worst places for a meeting I have ever seen. So, okay. I will vote no on that one. That's fine with me, <laughs> Councillor Jordan. I'm fine with that too. The, um, the the school, the high school cafeteria area, um, the where they eat, yeah. that's, that's an, a big area too, when it already has tables. So that's what, a possibility. It's easy to get in and out from the side doors. What um, the, the problem there is that they'll, they're gonna have um, summer camp set up by then, so, and they use that space. I can talk with uh, you know Superintendent Wolfram in the morning as far as what would be available uh, for that. And I might have to, you know, there's facilities I know that we can get a hold of, and then there's others that you know. That there's, if we're talking school facilities, I need to speak with them to see uh, where they're at. I, I don't want to write a check on that that I can't cover, but that's pretty reconcilable in the morning. Okay, so let's plan for the twenty second. We'll take the vote in a second on this. I know we still have to vote on the motion, Deb, um, and then. Um, uh, we can nail down the venue in the next 24 hours or so yeah, and yeah. include that in the um, meeting notice that goes out. So are there any other points of discussion on this before we vote? Okay. Deb, go uh, ahead. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Yes. Councilor Noonan. Yes. Chairman Garvin. Yes. Motion carries. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, next up is item number 98-2021, which is 18 on our agenda. Consideration of the collective bargaining agreement that has been reached between the town and the Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this item? I see nobody raising hands. Matt, do you wanna give a very brief overview of the conclusion of the negotiations with the union? I would be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, we, what we are looking at this evening, there is a three-year uh, contract with uh, annual increases of, for compensation of 2%, 2%, and 2% for each year. Uh, so that's, that is the one of the large economic questions that was answered. Uh, most of the remaining terms stayed the same. The other change would be to also uh, move their retirement plan from the current plan to a plan 3C in the uh, main state retirement for, uh, pension system. Uh, there are some other areas there related to uh, uh, fitness, uh, fitness training and uh, testing along those lines, which are, are consistent with other uh, surrounding uh, departments as well, and updated those to more modern standards. Uh, but uh, the, the, the primary efforts that we had there are, are economic at this point in time. And uh, uh, there's also additional language in order to, to change the, uh, the retirement plan uh, that I received from Maine Purse today that we had provided to the council. So uh, if the council is so inclined to approve this, uh, if we could have a, a motion on that as well, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Great. Uh, would any council like to make a motion? Ahead, I'll, move that, I'll move that we approve the collective bargaining agreement with the uh, um, unions as, as presented by the manager. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Noonan. Any discussion? Matt, thanks for your work on this. Thanks to um, the uh, leadership of the union. Um, for uh, the good faith negotiations and uh, look forward to um, productive three years of contract. So if there's no other discussion, we'll call the roll. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. That's the conclusion of our regular agenda. Is there anybody remaining from the public that would like to speak about? Oh, go ahead, Matt, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may. Uh, could we also get a motion from the council to uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yep. vote to change its plan for its eligible police officers effective July 1st for 2021 for future service only? I'll motion to <laughs> approve the town manager just said. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Boucher. I was looking for that email. <laughs> yeah. uh, moved by Councilor Boucher, is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, we can vote on that, Deb, sorry. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I had one other item. Pushing it, it, Matt. I know, sorry. Uh, the one last thing I had, uh, the Public Works uh, uh, CBA, I will also have that. Uh, hopefully I can have that for action. If the council will be meeting next week, I'll have that teed up for you to take action on uh, possibly at the end of that. Of that work session as a special meeting yes if, if that would work it, okay it, uh, it was we're just on the question of getting through the red lines but everything's come to agreement uh just we just could not get it delivered uh, for this evening so i uh, apologize for okay that. that's understandable um anything else matt 
I'm out. I'm out. All right. I got to find some uh, space for next week. <laughs> is there anybody remaining from the public that would like to speak about something that was not on tonight's agenda? But now's your chance to do so. I see no hands. Is there a motion to adjourn? Moved by Councilor Boucher. Second by Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Any discussion? I just want Councilor to make Boucher. sure that we scheduled the library workshop. Oh, I don't yes. remember talking about that Thank you. before Thank we adjourn. Much. Thank you. Um, Hold on a second. Let me get to July. Um, are folks around um, the latter part of the July 4th week? Definitely on Monday, Tuesday, that. Wednesday. Not sure about Thursday yet. I can't do Thursdays. How's Wednesday the 7th? Good. Thumbs up, thumbs up. If I can do it if I need to, but if Tuesday is also open, I'd prefer it. I'll have to miss something on Wednesday. If, uh... How's oh, Tuesday for everybody? Say again? <laughs> Tuesday's good? Yeah, both days are open too for the calendar. Um, let's tentatively plan for Tuesday the 6th. And Matt, can you just check with Rachel since uh, she'll probably want to participate? Um, yes, sir. And if not, we can we can schedule, uh, we can reschedule, we can have what, maybe Wednesday as the backup date. Okay. Yep, we okay. will do that, sir. Yep, not a problem. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Nicole, for remembering that. Uh, so any other discussion on adjourning? <laughs> <laughs> I motion to adjourn. So I think we already had a first and a second on actually adjourning. So is there, if there's no other discussion, we'll vote, Deb? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Right.